Ghanaians don't realize. When I was a young man, I bought insurance. I said at the end of 10, 15 years, I can then build a house, $100,000. At the end of the uh, period, I got 100000 which would have been equivalent to $100,000. The city has depreciated to 300 cities to one. What did I get? $3,000. It couldn't even build an outhouse. So if you are running an economy where there's a rapid depreciation of your currency, you are making it difficult for people to save. Right. You are making it difficult for your pension funds mm -hmm. to move so that you can use it for building infrastructure because that is a long-term long savings. So we need to get back to the period and before Ghana Beyond Aid was pronounced in this country, two years before, the economists mm -hmm. had an editorial which was talking about putting developing countries beyond aid. aid. And they say, the money that you raise, use it for three things. Security, make people save with that. Then, education, how you educate your people, that is important, health, those three. Mm -hmm. The rest, you want to build, make sure you are borrowing. And if you are borrowing, make sure there is a stream of income to pay for, pay it. for it. Or, it goes to strengthen the whole economy, the private sector, so that the capacity of the country to raise taxes and pay can be paid so that you don't run into a place where you say you have uh, debt. So where we are now is difficult. We've never been there before. Not too many countries have been able to have that type of debt and be able to survive. So it's very difficult. We've never been there before. And we need to sit up now and see how can we not turn the corner. We are not probably even in the corner <laughs> on the road yet. We are not on the road. No. So we talk about turning the corner. Yep. I'm going to come back to you on, on uh, the financial sector because I mean, the private sector is being seen as the only hope to lead the process of recovery from this crisis. And already they are faced with, with the impact of what's happening in the financial sector. So we'll come back to that. But Professor Kornath Mbambati, you, you were part of the, the first term of this administration. You know, there was a lot of goodwill for this particular government. What, what went wrong? I believe that you're talking about leadership. Indeed. Among other things. Yes. Uh, sometimes, at some point, uh, I guess, ask myself, so who are the leaders? You ask who are the leaders? Yes. If we, if, who, who is leading us? The president. You know, uh, yes, theoretically, yes. I mean, we vote for somebody to lead us. Indeed. But then you have people who are, have not been voted for, they have no position anywhere, but they appear to be taking decisions and, and deciding for us and disrespecting us. So, you know, in some countries, there will be people behind the scenes from various backgrounds, political, ethnic, who meet and decide or, and say that, look, this is our country. Mm -hmm. We are not going to make it go down. Yeah. And therefore, they help take decisions. I mean, and I don't think we have anything like that here. Mm -hmm. A body that is supposed to do that it's not doing that. Well, that's the Council of States. Um... Well, that, I don't know whether the Council of State is doing that, you know. Uh, so what I'm saying is that we need to identify who our leaders are, how they think, and because the leaders are supposed to help us solve problems. Is that not what's happening now? No. See, and and, and uh, my brother, uh, Dr. Nyawit said it, that leadership, or maybe you did it, that we have to solve some basic problems. Mm -hmm. Food, shelter, clothing, security, defense. And then the leadership, you have to give us hope. And also prepare us for future challenges. And now, we are not able to meet any of our basic needs. And we are not being preparing for, for future challenges that we may face. And I believe that 
what we have failed ourselves is technology. Because I've never seen any country that has developed without the capacity to do anything. If we import everything from toothpick to aircraft, there's no way that we can make it. So you ask yourself, why do we have investors? I mean, we talk about industrialization. I cannot see how we can industrialize without the involvement of the investors, the research institutions, the academic institutions, industry, and then uh, uh, commercial, for example, uh, fabricators or something. I mean, they have these professional associations and so on. We need to mobilize them. But then, we have a situation in this country where we have decided to invest in projects, not in human beings. Mm -hmm. So that you get a feeling that Ghanaians are not needed by the leadership because it's easy to go and borrow money to come and board a road, uh, interchange, or something without involvement of Ghanaians. And that's what is happening. So I sit here and ask myself, look, I have a, a lot of knowledge. I mean, I can do many things. Mm -hmm. But who has told me to do anything? Or you, or people here? What, what have you been told to do? With all your experience, what you know, and so on, the investors, the capacity there, the research institutions, the academic institutions, what are their roles in the development of this country? We don't need, I seem, seem to need them. So why do we even ask myself, why do we have investors? What are they supposed to do? Investors are supposed to think, identify our problems, and find a solution, whether technical, uh, archaeology, economics, or something. So this is my, the way I see it. If we don't solve this technology problem, you know, industrialization, and not define anything to be industrialization, 1D1F is not industrialization. 1D1F is not it's industrialization. Not. Alone, it's not. That's, that, that's this government's trump card to industrialization. That no, it, you are setting up industries without linkages. You know, I mean, you can compare it to what Nkrumah did. A number of industries have been built and are thriving. You just had the trade minister say you that. Try, the what? I'm, what are the linkages? You know, if you are industrial, industrializing, you do things that will help you improve upon what you are doing in future okay. so that there will be linkages. See, the Chinese, we've forgotten what they did, you know, in 1983, the China program 863 named after the year and month of the program. 86, 1986, March, when four weapon scientists wrote a private letter to Den Xiaoping mm -hmm. that said, we have problems. If we don't commercialize our knowledge, if we don't research and do things and get the civilian population to commercialize knowledge, we are doomed. And so you say, okay, go ahead. And therefore, they set up Decided by setting up institutions for energy, uh, agriculture. material science, agriculture, agriculture uh, space science, and so on. And so they got all the research institutions involved, the universities and so on, academia, to think. And everything we are seeing now is a result of what they were doing, research. Because let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. And Kroma set up, uh, let's say, a grass factory in uh, Abosu. Okay, mm -hmm. and he knew that he was going to get the raw material, the sand from Zima, which was quite close. Uh, but he did not have the time. So if you are setting up such a factory, you have to think about fiberglass and other things. If you are think about the Sanyo factory in uh, Tema, for example, mm -hmm. you just assemble radios without thinking about the next thing, uh, building transistors and doing those things in this country. Then it is not industrialization. So if we set up uh, a factory to process juice and you don't think about the next step, so what next? But you see, it's one thing actually having the capabilities and another, after you are invited to serve, been given the needed support and then the environment to be able to thrive. Because you were saying that you have a lot of capabilities. You, you serve in government before. Now, did you have that kind of support and environment to be able to give enough of what you have, or you would say that you, you were handed out of office? No. Let me tell you. Let me give you a very big example. As I said, I believe that 
we cannot develop if we don't have the capacity to do things ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I came out with this idea of setting up a national foundry and machine tool center, a CNC machine tool center, computer numerical control machine tool center. Okay. That will give you the capacity to build spare parts, machine parts, or reverse engineer things. And then the foundry to do, I mean, if you are constructing road, for example, mm -hmm. all the drainage covers are imported. But these are low tech things that can be, can be developed. So that while you were minister? That is one of, one of the projects. I see. But then I left government and the project has come to a standstill. Near. Some of the equipment that we imported are now roasting in some warehouse at Atomic Energy. With the place is weedy, nothing has it's been left to rot. Left to rot. And I can cite many examples. So you need people to buy into it. I mean, as I said, they may not see the need for it, but it's easy to import road co drainage covers for roads or telecom things uh, that may give people money. But then we need to develop because the, the poverty gap is a technology gap. Mm. The poverty gap, if we don't bridge that gap, there's, we can't make it. And the gap between us and them is widen all the time. And that is why I said we need the investors, we need the research institutions, okay. we need the uh, trade people, uh, professionals, uh, as I said, the fabricators. I mean, if we take a grip, for example, uh, there, are, I, there, there are Ghanaian fabricators who can fabricate a lot of things. And then I also know Ghanaians who have a PLC, the Programmable Logic Control, who mm -hmm. can automate things. So it's a question of uh, not being selfish, not being greedy, but using the money to develop Ghanaians and not in projects. And the Ghanaians will build these things ourselves. You see the element of greed and selfishness in, in leadership now. Of course. There's a lot of greed. Greed. See, uh, let me acknowledge uh, Mr. Setekwe, his former finance minister, is joining us on Zoom. Setekwe, good morning. Uh, we'll rectify the sound. But Dr. Nyonyo Tomaklo, Professor Kobna from Bob Bartim made the point about who yeah, is good morning. Can you hear me, please? leading this country. And, uh, and, 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 and whether it's the president or otherwise. Because if the president is, is elected, but then you have people around him, as he put it, who disrespect the likes of you. Is it the same experience you share? I agree with the prof. Absolutely. That's why I said everything depends on the leader. Look, when we had independence, mm -hmm. I was a kid, I remember, but what we were taught was that apart from the Union of South Africa, but then South Africa was in the hands of the white people, the other highest per capita in Africa was Gokus, Ghana. There's an economist here, if I'm telling life, you should say, which follows this country had resources and was a rich country. As he's saying, if you don't have people, you get them into a room and they think strategically. So you plan towards something. This is exactly what Prophet is saying. For the future, we have been an independent country for almost 60 something years now. What have we? We got independent almost on the same day with Malaysia. Go to Malaysia now, go to Singapore. It's all the leader, the leader. If the leader knows what he's about, you see progress. But, but if he doesn't know what he's about, then you see this hang on, which we have in this government. As he put it to you, you don't even know what they do. Yes, it's to look for money out of the country. Get money out of the country. Yeah, and that money. is the biggest problem facing this nation now. You're saying the president doesn't know exactly what to do? Look. I talk about leadership. If the leader is just like a commander, if you have a commander who is no good, you your troops will be slaughtered. That was happening now. Absolutely, the commander is no good. The, the president is no good. If the commander commander were to be good, if a minister goes wrong, he must have that strength and call him to leave his government. We have had a lot of infractions in this country. You know it. Who has been sacked? 
You're expecting some My sacking God. and reshuffling. You see, the way I am saying, and I said this on authority, where mm -hmm. I know the, quite the law of what is happening in this country. Now, if the monies that have been stolen out of this country are brought back, at least we shall get some more. And what Prophet Boateng is saying, I believe strongly that if we are able to get the academia and all these people to do strategic thinking, and even our, 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 our young, young, young people, those in even secondary school, in certain countries, they are taught how to think strategically, mm -hmm. to create something. Yes. Do we have it here? You see strategic thinking oh. in this. You don't government. build a nation where what we, look, Nkrumah started well. I must say that. As he said, Nkrumah set up certain factories. But he was advised. Listen to me carefully. Once again, Kwame is here. Kwame is my senior. And he has experience there. I think after Kwame, I don't think there has been anybody. He was the youngest principal secretary we had in this country. If I'm telling mm -hmm. lies, he's here. Youngest. In his 20s. Now, if you have a leader who knows exactly what he wants for the country, the moment you are appointed a leader, you must know what really you want for that country. Just as I say, like the military, mm -hmm. you are given a target and you pursue the target. You follow me? But here, it is a free for all. And what hurts me is that we've seen leaders of this tradition of us, the new patriotic party, who really were leaders. I can give you an example. Here's one example. B.J. Darucha. I mean, these are people who were selfless. Do we have it now? Do we have it now? We don't have it. If you want to hear from me, I say we don't have it. And until we get such people, and the, and the most pathetic thing is that those we are so called, we have maybe I might call them as successors, mm -hmm. would rather destroy this country com completely. Because their interest is to get money and property, I mean, not the, to the, develop the younger the politicians. Um, I said those we have now, politicians, politicians of today, absolutely. How would they? You don't build a nation this way. But the problem is an African problem. I won't even say it's Ghana alone. An African problem. What leadership does is to siphon money out of the country, out of the continent. Look at what is happening in Niger now. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So called ECOWAS, they know the causes of the problem. That when you have a leader who would not like to leave power, when you have a leader who likes to manipulate elections, these are the results. And until we start thinking like mature people, there will be coup d'etats after coup d'etats. That's all. We've seen what's happened in the case of French Dr. appointment and then also the appointees of this, of this administration and the president not taking action even when there is that evidence of non-performance. Why is the president not, not reshuffling or sacking ministers from where you sit? Because you are a member of the party, a founding member for that matter. You know what we don't know. I'm not a suspended member. But I will talk. <laughs> well, I'm a founding member. Just yeah. like Kwame is. Without Kwame Pianin, he's still... I'm surprised. In fact, I came here to listen to him. By your advert, he was a key speaker. I came here to listen to him. So when you called me to sit there, I was really surprised. Look, <coughs> this is a man. I was in prison with him together. Before, before I joined him, he has already served about nine to eight to nine years in prison just because of this country, Ghana. When we, came, when we were in prison, I want to cite an example. This gentleman wore prison uniform. That's a prisoner. Then one day he called me. I remember very well. Myself and I think late, uh, late uh, Colonel, Colonel um, Chumog, I always forget his name, who was once a leader in this country. 
he was with a champion school. Mm. They said, oh, he's doing something. He should come and have a look. So we came out with, outside the prison wall. Not knowing before, even then, he's had a plantation of uh, what you, pineapple. This same man, who, listen to me carefully. Plantation of pineapple. Why is a prisoner? Why is a prison? And uh, the records are there. If I'm telling lies, I mean, why is a prisoner? Pineapple, cassava. What the prison had? The, the, outside the, 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 the prison wall was a huge land. Which prison is it? In Sawam. In Sawam. <laughs> now, Kwame then moved on to start poultry farming. I, I, I mean, for honest, I thought he was joking. <laughs> Within less than six months, fowls for the market. He served Ghana Airways chicken to be used on aircraft. You see? So when we got out of prison, and this man wanted the leadership of the party. I back him because I know what he can do for this country. And it hurts me. There are two people in this country I've said it carefully, himself and late Kojo Baonredo. It's pathetic that Kojo Baonredo has died. These two people, you see leadership qualities in them. Now, I, I remember I back Kwame Strong, not myself alone, and others. I told him, I know this man. I was in prison with him. Even in prisons, he showed leadership skills. So I don't see why I shouldn't back him now. We back him. Finally, the case went to court, Supreme Court. And he was refused to leave this country. A man who was sentenced to prison because he wanted to save this country from the hands of soldiers. So you can see that we don't know what we are about in this country. It's as simple as that. To really lose such a person mm -hmm. will tell you that we don't know where we are going. We we'll just talk. I mean, this sort of loose talk in this country, that's what is happening. Everybody is just talking. But when we want people who can think strategically, plan, for now, the future, and especially beyond the future. That's why, that's why the whites are always ahead of us. They have a thinking machine. We don't have it. If you name, so earlier you talked about the confidence in the financial sector and how that was impacted by the, the cleanup exercise, which you have eloquently uh, stated your position about how it was carried out. And then we still have people's monies locked up as a result of that exercise as we speak. Also, then it led up to this DDEP, and which has also impacted on the financial sector confidence. And then what's happening with, with the central bank right now, uh, at the end of the year 2022, posting over 60 billion CDs loss. Do we have a financial sector now? Let me go one step back to uh, leadership. You know, there's a vision and then executing. Yang was talking about our experience in prison. When Nkrumah built in Saman prison, he had a hospital, a clinic there. That clinic was left dormant. When Yang was brought there, he's a medical doctor. I said, now we are going to reactivate this clinic. Mm -hmm. He said, stop your madness. I'm thinking about myself. <laughs> I said, you can't think about yourself. <laughs> we have a lot of prisoners who don't have access to uh, medical attention. He agreed. I got the Catholic sisters. They brought the equipment, refurbished the place, brought us medication. There was a young woman uh, who was in the female prison, a nurse. We brought her, and then Nyahu mm -hmm. took over, and the people were there. So see, if Nyahu was not there, and the lady from the uh, other side was not there, we couldn't have executed that. So sure. The poultry farm that we did, there were prisoners from Cote d'Ivoire who knew how to uh, prepare 
chicken. So when we grow them, they would then do it oven ready, and then where Ghana Airways was exporting it, Kingsway was selling it. So you need. Indeed. You Let's need, put our hands together. It's need, worth it. You need the executing capacity around you, not just uh, uh, a vision. Mm. We are talking about moving Ghana forward. I got a uh, MasterCard Foundation to give us uh, $250,000, and we brought Ghanaian technologists from outside, and 50 of them from outside, 50 from here, we call it bridging the technology gap. I needed a minister to guide us. I called uh, Professor Primfor Mbwatin. All the preparatory meetings we had, some in my office in the house, mm. he was there. The meetings, not just ministers who come and open and run away, he was there. This idea of building foundries, yeah. it's clear that all the, when you are digging the gutters, the, the diggers, we can make them here. He talked about the Chinese, Deng Xiaoping. They set up the Chinese Academy camps for agricultural machinery science. So they started. They were making the machines. We tried to bring them here into Ghana. They were prepared to help us bring it here. They said, we'll bring the equipment, get to your engineers, and then we work together. You know, the, the leadership is not just uh, the uh, president. He has to have the vision. Mm -hmm and go. One of the things I want us to talk about is that the problems we are trying to solve in Ghana, we are solving them from the air. When you go to Bank of Ghana, the understanding is that there will always be, there are always three governors. Mm -hmm. There will be a microeconomist to look at the bigger picture, inflation and so forth. Mm -hmm. You have a lawyer to look at the bigger side. Then you have a banker to be able to liaise with the bank to see what is wrong. You see, when you are a referee, it doesn't mean that you know how to play the football. Mm -hmm. So you need an operator with you to say, this is where we need to go. Two of the best leaders I worked with in terms of man, Kofi Annan, best in delegating authority. We say, when you are a leader, you don't micromanage. Mm -hmm. You micro monitor by leave the people to work. Another good one, uh, George Hammond, mm -hmm. who set up uh, what has become a, a UMB. Mm -hmm. You know, they give their people the jobs and then you supervise. What Professor said about what he was trying to set up, you know, the people in the ministry, those people down there, they should not allow it to die. That's why we had to call permanent secretaries. We became principal technical and chief director. The idea was to have the institutional memory. Right. Once we have the institutional memory, even if that thing goes, you go. And when I was in the Ministry of Finance, one of the guys told me when I was rushing around, he said, Kwame, one of the jobs we do that we have to learn is to have to stop politicians from destroying the country with stupid ideas. Stop politicians from destroying the country with stupid ideas. We block them. So when you come, you give the job to them. They say, this is bad. Uh, Minister, uh, what is happening on this project? Oh, it is receiving attention. <laughs> it means it's getting close to the dustbin. Mm. They are not going to implement it. So they are the ones who are supposed to be telling you what was in the past. So. What is happening in the, uh, I'll call them the regulators, I think. Yes. I, I don't like criticizing Bank of Ghana because it was the only uh, reliable, respected institution we have in Ghana. All the institutions were gone. Mm -hmm. You know, is that the domestic debt exchange crippled the banks. Their minimum capital is gone. Mm -hmm. They are impaired. And you say, I'll destroy them first and then 
set up a financial stability fund right. to come and raise them up. Why kill them first before you resurrect them? Hmm. You know, so the, for the first time, the IMF program that we have, in the past, immediately you announce the program, then stabilized. Investors realize, oh, there's a big boy in the room. The children will stop misbehaving. Mm -hmm. We did not go to Eurobond to borrow to finance recurring expenditure. When President Kufo and uh, Paul Apa led and Ban Redu came, the South Mafo were there, to go to, it was to go and borrow because when the government borrows, mm -hmm. the government is supposed to be safe. So if the government can borrow at 5%, it means the bigger companies in Ghana can go and borrow maybe at 6 7%. Mm -hmm. And our small savings left here will be left to the other companies so that interest rates don't go uh, sky high. So now other ministers came in and they decided, oh, we can always go and borrow. To do what? To finance chop money. You don't mm -hmm. borrow money to finance chop money. You borrow money to increase the assets and the wealth uh, of the company. So we have a problem. And then the regulators, they what are called, you know, uh, regulatory forbearance. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? It means if you are civil aviation in Ghana, you are telling the Americans, these planes that I have and I've regulated, which are flying into America, they may not be all that well maintained. The pilots may not be that good, but give us time and we'll come back later. They say, don't fly into America. The regulators, Bank of Ghana, insurance, they are supposed to tell us that when we invest there in this bank, they are safe. Mm -hmm. And say regulatory forbearance, you put the regulations aside. Why well, put them aside? If they were not necessary, then we don't need the regulators. If the minimum capital doesn't make sense, then push it aside. So I was very surprised the way we are packaging this. For the first time, the Western countries sat there mm -hmm. and said, when you give a haircut, to our citizens, give a haircut also to your foreign, to your citizens. citizens. The moral equivalence is wrong. When the depreciation has meant that all my assets in terms of dollars have been reduced by 50%, the bondholder, he's going to get his money. Mm -hmm. That bondholder, he calculated the risk he was prepared to take to give minor money, and the interest rate reflected that. And he's going to get his money in dollars. Mm -hmm. I'm getting mine. See, the 50% already gone. Oh. So there should have been no more equivalent. We shouldn't have agreed. And Ghana and Nigeria refused to agree to the framework. But immediately we went on our knees when they say we are negotiating within that framework. You take money from pensioners and say, I'm taking it. What has the person done to reduce? And the solution that is coming, everything, we are not going to be paying any of those debts until Nana Kufad is no longer president, until the Minister of Finance is no longer president. What is that? And my generation, who are borrowing all this money and yours, mm -hmm. you may not even be paying, your grandchildren will pay. It doesn't make sense. We should sit down and say, how are we doing this? How can Cocoa Board incur these debts when all they are doing is just taking cocoa from farmers and selling it abroad? What has Cocoa Board got to do with uh, building roads? And most of these companies mm -hmm. that are having problems are building new head offices. <laughs> we have come to this state of government by procurement, and not just this government alone, all governments. So spending has become development. The more projects you come, the more you spend, the more you buy from outside, the better. As uh, uh, Frimpon Martin is saying, to develop in people, 
let the people know what is it. How much will you get? You won't get 10% of what? Uh, 100,000 Ghana cities. But if you are employed, so we should cut this procurement Government by procurement. That's everybody is interested. The incentive system we put in this system in the, in the country don't work. The incentive system means that you're a young man, you're ambitious, uh, join political parties. You don't have to have any experience. Mm -hmm. You come. What is talking about the military? Yeah. You have a target. No minister is given any target. Right. And the president's job, like all chief executive down the line, you know you are not going to do the work. So your job is how to get good, competent people with integrity. And we use the word integrity loosely. When somebody has integrity, you will even approach him to give him an envelope. You'll be scared. And we've, we've had it before. Between 1979 to 1991, there was minimal corruption in this country. People were scared. Rollins may slap slap you. <laughs> you know, so it's not it's not this government alone we are talking about. We are talking about when you want to become president, your job is you are not the executor. Your right. job is to find uh, good people, how to identify good people to work for you. Mm -hmm. That's the job. And then motivate them, incentivize them to do the work uh, for you. But this is what we need to, how do we start from here? I think uh, in my village they say, the more the they are carrying about mobile. So forget about the past. Let's learn lessons from the past and say, how do we take the lessons to move ahead? I used to tell from Bon his mm -hmm. project, if he had brought his project beyond the time of any civilian rule, it would never have happened. The, you mean the, yeah, the cardio center. Ca cardiothoracic center? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Rollins went to Rollins. Do it. Forget about the rules. Just do it. I was trying as chief executive to improve the price of cocoa. Farmers were cutting their cocoa trees and growing cassava. Why? Because we were paying them 20% of the FOB price. I went to Rollins when he came. He came to meet me as chief executive. He was there. And I said, farmers are cutting their cocoa farms, to grow cassava. He said, why? I said, the price we are telling them is no good. And you know how he talks. Mm -hmm. He uses words, explicitly deleted, and said, my father was doing that. I also asked him to cut it down. What price do you want? I said, we should start with increasing the price by 30%. Go and do it. That's all. That's all. 20 minutes. It had taken me three months, six months, with civilian governments and the governments that were there. That was a leader. Go and do it. Then the execution starts. So you can have a vision, mm -hmm. but the vision needs executors around you yeah. to implement. When you say Ghana beyond aid, what does it mean? It means we are using our own people. Fine. Ghana beyond aid, what does minerals? We have lithium. Are there Ghanaians abroad who knows how to use lithium? The guy who is helping uh, Botswana do their lithium project. He's a Ghanaian professor of chemistry. Are we using him? In spite of Ghana beyond it, we are giving lithium resources True. to Atlantic people to come. They, they are dig, going to dig that death. And they pride themselves that it's near the shore, the port. They will put it in a thing. Nothing has changed from gold when we're taking the okay. thing and taking outside. Hmm. Great point. Please, let's put our hands together for our guest in studio and Mr. Sektepe is former finance minister. He's been on listening to you all. So I'll come back to you. But Mr. Tekwe, thank you for, for joining us. Now we have the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry uh, also joining us in studio. In fact, they, they, they partnered with us all through this, this conversation and other private sector players as well. Now we, we see what's happening to the financial sector and, and ultimately to the lender of last resort, being the Bank of Ghana. One of the explanations they've given is that they had to take this 50% haircut to save the economy. Other than that, 
things would have gone haywire to serve as a residual. Is that a justifiable defense for this over 60 billion CDs lost the Bank of Ghana has posted? Yeah, thank you very much, and I hope you can hear me this time. Um, yes. I would say that it is not a good defense. The reason I am saying that it is not a good defense is that uh, if you recall, the much of the non-performing loans, you know, which occurred, were due to the um, Doomso era, and we did Esla. In fact, before we left office, we had started paying the energy sector debts with the ESLA amount. The volume. As we speak, ESLA has brought in 33 billion Ghana cities. Uh, by 2026, it is expected to bring in 66 billion Ghana cities. It is the collateralization of ESLA that made it impossible to pay the energy sector debt including ipps you know and that is why we had the banking sector collapse in fact to demonstrate we had used um Esla to repay to You would also recall that under the Mahama administration, we achieved zero financing. That means that the government did not borrow from the central bank. Indeed, under the Treasury Single Account and under the book building, that is the government bonds, we were able to finance you know, our uh, budgets without borrowing for the from the central bank for the first time even though we were allowed to use five percent uh of uh, previous revenues to support the budget uh this was part of the century agreement leading into the uh imf program let me so so it is Clearly, not justified to see the bank where it is now. It is, and let me come back to that. But before that, let me state also absolutely that of the bonds that we issued, uh, and by the way, I should have acknowledged my seniors, you know, who are there. I'm sorry uh, for not doing that earlier on. But let me state that we did not use any of the bonds that we issued uh, for consumption let me give three examples we have ghana infrastructure investment fund which was to continue with the model that we use you know to finance terminal credit And uh, we apologize. Um, there's um, technical hitch in there. Uh, we'll rectify that with Mr. Setepe and um, get a, a bit more into some of the issues that he was talking about. But if you just joined us, this is the Three Business TV Three Thought Leadership Series. We're talking about the state of affairs of the economy and then also this economic self governance. Uh, that we're talking about or we aspire for as a country. Is it a myth or a reality? What has to change? What has to give for us to be able to realize this self-governance that we, we're talking about? So if you look at the, the various sectors, for instance, I mean, we've talked a lot more about the financial sector, uh, even with the medical field where you are, nurses and doctors are living in droves out of this country. We talk about the agri sector. I mean, we import over $400 million worth of tomatoes from Burkina Faso, over $21 million worth of onions from Niger. Something is happening there right now. 
and Burkina had their own fair share of instability sometime last year. I mean, do, do, do we own this economy? If not, what has to change? It's a, commit, it's a commitment to Ghana. And we've heard examples about people who were in prison, but they were committed to Ghana. Mm -hmm. My worry now is that when young people begin to lose hope in the system, then we, we are on a very dangerous path. You know, mm -hmm. we have to have a situation where young Ghanaians will have hope in this country. That they will say, look, at least things are not too good, but I think that it will be, they will be better. You speak to a lot of young people. Do you feel that they have a sense of hope now? No. And I talk to my children. I mean, they are well educated and so on. They say, brother, you know, we think that this country is on the wrong footing. And that pains me because throughout my life, I work for this country. They know? tell you the country is on the wrong footing. Yes. And that pains me. And, you know, that they are not prepared to sacrifice as I did. You know, and I, we can't blame them. So the, the point is that we must restore hope to these young people. Otherwise, they have dreams they can no longer afford to postpone. Young people of Ghana have dreams they can no longer afford to postpone if we don't help them to realize those dreams. We talk about leadership in agriculture. It's very painful. And the thing is that we have people in CSIR, I'm talking about research institutions. Mm -hmm. Ghana Atomic Energy Commission, the amount of work that we've done in agriculture, uh, the universities, and, and then some private people. But we don't use them. And sometimes it's so painful. When I was minister, I went to Bunso. This is where we kept our gem plasm, the things, uh, the plants that we grow, uh, the things that we want to keep for posterity. That's where we keep them. At some point, they did not even have money to pay for electricity because we have to cool these uh, uh, seeds and plants and so on. And this he was going to turn the thing off. Mm. So we have to go and find money to, to do that. Atomic Energy had conducted some research on how to manage malaria. You know, they have radiated some mosquitoes and were about to release them so that when they met with others outside, uh, they will not spread the mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. But then they could not pay the electricity bills. And again, somebody went and, and shut off that thing and, and destroyed everything. So the thing is that we must know where we are going, where we are. And the effect of our, of our inaction. Let me give another example. Not too long ago, we had a problem with one of our FPSO, this oil production. You know, when we have big pipes and we want to connect them, there's something we call an O-ring, uh, which you need to, to, to seal the thing. One of them got, or some of them got spoiled, and we had to send them to one of the Scandinavian countries for about three, four, six months before we could get them back. If we had a machine to center that we had planned, it could have been done in days, two days. So this is how we are losing and spending money on things that are not supposed to be. This thing pays me. We should develop the capacity to do things. Young people are so, so gifted. I mean, I work with people, mm -hmm. uh, fabricators, yeah. and people who uh, can do automation. I, I, as I said, uh, Ghanaians can do Gary processing machine, this oil, this, but then we need some people to put some uh, uh, electric motors in between to automate the system. And there are Ghanaian firms doing that. But nobody knows them, and nobody cares about them. Is it that we're ha having the, the interventions but not targeted the right way? Because any time this comes up, government will refer to certain interventions and policies they put in place, GEA, Ghana Enterprise Agency, and no. formerly MBSSI, and those other ones, NEIP and others. They will refer to that. Yeah, so but, what's but, wrong? But then if you want to refer to them, give them the resources. Let's say AGI or any other... Uh, any other organization, mm -hmm. give them the resources. But then politicians will be, want to be in charge. If it's about importation, if it's about this, procurement, they want to be in charge. And not the agencies that are supposed to implement these things. Why is this the case? That po the politicians want to be in charge. Even it's money. <laughs> it's as simple as that. <laughs> I mean, 
because see, look, importation increases. I don't want to go into that here because my uncle is here. <laughs> at least increase price by about at least twenty percent. Right. But if the things are done here, you will not get those things. Uh, so the point is that the poverty gap is a technology gap, and Mr. Pianim helped us in a way by getting the Mastercard Foundation to give us the resources to bring Ghanaian scientists together, researchers. We had a very good meeting in Pediasse. Uh, the president was there to commission it. And I was so hopeful that for once, we could get Ghanaians from outside, Europe, America, Asia, and those within to plan with the Association of Ghana uh, uh, Engineer Institute of Ga Engineering, yeah. Ghana Institute of Engineering, do up this plan, and I was very hopeful that look, now you're on the path towards doing things. And I showed this idea to the president. We are going to do agenda one 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 one, going to put agenda one one. But then every piece of equipment is so important. We may be able to put up houses, uh, but then there will not be hospitals because there will be no instruments, the nurses are running away, and so on. So we wanted to develop the capacity to build some of this medical equipment. We may not be able to build an X-ray machine, but if it's a forceps, if it's a scapular blade, if it's this, mm -hmm. we should be able to do them. And that will account for uh, at least about 40% of what we use here. You know, we have rubber you know, in the Western region, and we are still importing things, condoms, packages, mm -hmm. rubber, car, wiper blades, engine seats and so on. I mean, there's so much we can do, and we are so gifted. So let us look inward, train people, spend more money on people instead of on projects. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do the projects. But what's, what's the point in burden, very nice road, interchange? What, what, what runs on it? Mm -hmm. Apart from passengers and uh, Chaco and we, what we have run, you know, on our roads. We need to see um, tractor parts moving from here to an assembly plant. We need to see things, manufactured things, uh, somebody building machines moving from one place to the other, the other for assembly and so on. We need to see these things so that we know, yes, we are moving on. Uh, yes. <laughs> Dr. Nyonya, what, what has to change, really? Because we all admit that all is not well going forward. I once again, leadership. <laughs> leadership has to Absolutely. change. You see, let, let me give you a simple example. In the U.S. recently, mm -hmm. when they tried Trump, listen to me carefully, they tried Trump. When he won the elections, I was amazed though. But they gave him that chance. The next election, they voted him out, even though he wanted to steal the election. And he's going to court because of that now. Can it happen here? You think it can't happen here? Oh, oh, God. I said the man stole the, he, he attempted, in fact, his was an attempt to steal the election. As I talked to you now, the case is in court. Yes. And the law is going to deal with him. Can that happen in this country? You think it can happen in this country? Oh, look, I've been around for some time. Even though Kwame is my senior, I always refer to because he's my senior. Look, I have my doubts at times about even the sort of judicial system that we have here. I'm telling you. Look at the way the U.S. judicial system operates. Indeed, Trump has asked that the judge must step down or something. Mm -hmm. It won't happen. It will never happen. But it can happen here. First in the history of this country, we've, we've had elections in this country. Mm -hmm. When Jerry John Rawlings, some, some of us went to jail because of him. We've had elections in this country when Kutu Achampon was in power, eh? Kutu wanted a referendum. And he organized the whole thing in such a way. He thought he would be listened to by, is it 
Uh, what's the name of the of the jail then? The, the electoral commissioner. Aban, eh? Aban. Yeah. Aban. He thought Aban would play ball with him. Recently, which was about 20, 25 years ago, Aban refused. And Kutu chased him right at the electoral commission. He has to jump a wall, a whole judge. <laughs> you see, there are things in this. We, we have seen things. People die because of elections. Now, most of the people I talk to, they say they are not interested. They are not fed up. And that is painful. And when that vehicle is, is created, something has to fail it. And what it is, you know it. I don't know. You, you know it. <laughs> you ask them. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we are not trading on a very, okay. very dangerous path. I've been saying it. I've said it time and again. Where we are going to is dangerous. People should start talking. But the Ghanaians are not talking. I have a feeling they are not suffering. If they were to be suffering, they will talk. They will come out. I'm not calling for a coup d'etat. I know what coup d'etat is. I've been a soldier before. And what coup d'etat can do. They really don't build a nation. But if you give them the opportunity, they will come. Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamaklo. And this is the three business thought leadership series, talking about leadership, which is everything, and dovetails into issues of business and finance. And, and uh, 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 yes, one sentence. I'm going to go for a quick, no, you are, we are not ending. We're going for a quick break, and then no. you, okay. yes. So please hold on to that thought. Yeah. And um, um, we'll have another guest joining the panel here with me. So stay with us. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. Professor Godfrey Bobkin will be joining us right after this. Stay with us. Are you ready to win solid cash every day with Cash Out? Be a proud winner of lots of cash simply by watching or listening to any of Media General stations. That's right, you are being rewarded for your loyalty. Tune in to all Media General brands. TV3, 3FM 92.7, Onia TV, Onia FM 95.1, All in Accra, Akuma FM 87.9 in Kamasi, and Connect FM 97.1 in Takradi. To enter the cash out raffle on your favorite Media General station, just dial star 439 hash follow the prompt and pick your favorite platform to enter voila you are now eligible to become one of the 10 lucky winners of a cool cash prize remember this is every day all day on your favorite media general station cash out and win big this is in partnership with radio entertainment limited this promo is regulated by the national lottery authority on the caritas lottery platform terms and conditions apply <laughs> win game show is exactly what you need this is the only game show when you are already rich before you begin to play every week two lucky people stand the chance of winning money all you have to do is go through some quizzes and fun games. Somebody from Peru is called. Perushi. Eh? Whatever you say, you have to be proud because your family people are watching. Somebody from Madagascar mm. is called Malagasy. Correct! Okay, okay, let's go, let's go. Uh -uh, it's you that will tell me, let's go. <laughs> you are not even winning. <laughs> Okay. Go the Amazing. Right. Jump Be proud. Okay. First of all, is Aikwe supposed to be a man or a woman? Put it on your forehead. Aikwe. <laughs> be a part of this game show right here on TV3 and take on some. Oh my God. <laughs> Join us on Here to Win Game Show, where you win it all. Hey, yeah, mama. Hey, mama. Hey, yeah, mama. Hey, mama. Here to win. Here to win, premiering on Saturday, 12 August at 8 p.m. on TV3.
The Ghana National Association of Teachers, NART, has scaled up its commitment to ensuring improved access to treatment for teachers battling cancer. Together with the Sweden Ghana Medical Center, SGMC, NART provides teachers and members on pension with free cancer treatment. Effective this particular year, when you retire, and unfortunately something like this thing happens to you, the center will take care of it. And on top, the Ghana National Association of Teachers also seeks better conditions of service for members in hard-to-reach community, as well as aiding better access to the professional development of members. Apart from the professional courses, we are going to have programs for our members, that members will be moving to Abankru to have a feel and also get continual professional development from the Institute. Learn more on TV3. Make a date with Not All every Wednesday at 5.45 p.m. and Sundays at 1.30 p.m. Not All. Hope for the Ghanaian teacher. Not Our shows Wednesdays at 5.45 p.m. and on Sundays at 1.30 p.m. on TV3. <laughs> Old rivalry that senior high schools engage in is still present within alumni. The battle for bragging rights to a particular endeavor remains even after school. If your school can cook, it means your school is here. If your school can boast of good culinary masterminds, this right here is the perfect platform to showcase that skill set. Alumni have met and they have chosen representatives to take up the task of preparing extraordinary dishes to bring victory to their respective schools. Tell me what you're cooking. Week in, week out, these schools will mount these workstations in a bid to buy your nutritional affinity to them. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare your taste buds and fasten your aprons. These culinary experts are set to battle for the enviable crown of being tagged lords of the kitchen. This is Kitchen Wars Season 2. Kitchen Wars Season 2, Sundays at 5 p.m. on TV3. Don't miss it. Sponsored by Gino Tomato Mix. And Napa Foods. Say and Napa. And here on Osoko. PGL. Watch Isono on TV3 Mondays to Thursdays and stand the chance of winning amazing prizes. Now you can win amazing prizes in the Isono Watch and Win competition. Answer an easy question at the end of the episode and text your answer to 0550-052-927. You can win airtime weekly and other amazing prizes like spa treatment and hampers at the end of the month. Catch Isono on TV3, Mondays to Thursdays at 8 p.m. TV3, first in news, best in entertainment. All sporting disciplines matter on Warm Up Plus. Ugh. Warm Up Plus, the most exciting hour on TV. So join the conversation and get updated. Get sports news, visit exciting places, and be in the know on Warmer Plus. Let's go, Diana. We're just getting started. We're just getting warmed up. Catch me, Yao Ufusulabi. And me, Aniela Alote. Warmer Plus, new season coming soon on TV3. It wasn't always this easy. When I was 26, I got my first chance to perform a surgery. Can I have and a selfie? Thank you so much. So I was holding the scalpel. My hands were trembling Excuse and... Excuse me, ma'am. Can I have your autograph, please? Uh, sorry, sir. Yes, go on. Well, then, as soon as the senior surgeon entered the OT, I... Yes, Dr. Matu. I'll be there in 30 minutes. It's an important surgery. Rain check? Hmm, sure. They are in love, but will they be able to adjust? Eternal love 
shows Tuesdays to Fridays at 6 p.m. only on TV3. Brought to you by Out Multipurpose Insecticide Spray and Quell. Welcome back from that quick break. This is the Three Business TV3 Thought Leadership Series, and we're talking about the economic self-governance, the state of affairs that we find ourselves in as a country, and then also what's happening to the financial sector. Extremely important uh, because um, if the Bank of Ghana is a lender of last resort and it finds itself in this situation, it's, it's a big worry for the people who are watching this particular space, and especially because of how it also impacts on the confidence in the financial sector, taking into consideration how we have for the past few years, traveled the path in the financial sector with the banking closures and the, also the impact of the DDEP and what we are seeing now. And in studio with me, we've been talking about leadership, Dr. Nyao Nyao Tamaklo, and then also Professor Kobana from Pomboating and Genim, our main speaker for this session. And joining us now, is Professor Godfred Buckping. He is a professor of finance at the University of Ghana. Thank you so much, Professor Godfred Buckping, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Before we went for the break, you had to make a point about the issues of leadership that Dr. Nyanya was saying. The point I was going to make is that it is very important that all of us as Ghanaians realize we are part of the leadership. You know, when something is happening in Ghana and somebody makes a comment, absolute silence. Mm -hmm. Nobody goes to support them yeah. when they are being maligned mm -hmm. and being insulted. And I think that it is important that we don't think there's a leader uh, somewhere. Uh, we invariably look at the top. One of the things I want to talk about is that the mistake we've made is that we are building the house from the top. There is no foundation. We had a very strong local government. When Anna came, he said, OK, let us elect the district chief executives. The district uh, assemblies are supposed to be the implementing units of the development uh, plans. Unfortunately, we think having a district is just a building and a district chief executive. That's not it. It's supposed to be economically viable, but we don't have, we've multiplied them. We are 32 uh, million people. A district economically viable should not be less than 2 million, 3 million. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're looking at. So now our 16 uh, regions should probably be the districts if we want to have economically viable units. Mm -hmm. So there will be leaders at the grassroots there. Mm -hmm. And if you have a district chief executive, um, a, a district chief executive, uh, Amansia, he is district chief executive, this place. We are both Ashantis. That's right. The tribal element is completely gone. gone. Right. When I get my money from the district assembly fund, mm -hmm. and you say buy furniture, and I use the money to hire the local carpenters to make wood. And he uses his to come to Accra to buy plastic furniture imported from abroad. And they give me the money for the school feeding program. And I ask the women, the farmers, to produce and feed the, the children. And he goes to buy his from Accra, deliver it and get his 10%. Next time, they are not voting for him. So, an important part of leadership we've left behind at the uh, grassroots there. And if they were responsible for sanitation yeah. and water, they would not go on. But we sit in Accra, the radio station, everybody is talking about macroeconomics and the top there. The real problems are down there. They'll be solved. They say, why are the chiefs quiet? How can the chief go and try to stop Galamsi with people who have guns. And some of the Chinese there who are working, they are also victims. They've been brought, their passports are taken away from them. Some of them are dying from malaria, diphtheria. So if you empower the grassroots, mm -hmm. the roads, feeder roads, 
they'll be responsible. They won't let the roads go bad. They won't let the water go bad. Soon, outside, they are talking about climate change and how to, we are here destroying our waters and rivers. That's what I wanted to talk about. Yeah. All of us, the traditional oh. rulers, the religious leaders, when people come to power, the people who spoil them are traditional rulers, are religious leaders. Thank you. Hmm. They go, they are worshipping them. I was in a church once. <laughs> I had to walk out. Why? <laughs> because we were then saying that the ministers are too many. And the priest was quoting the Bible. When somebody wanted to build, they say, no, he built a God bless me. He want 300 ministers to appoint them. He said, we are choked. There's too much money. We have to examine the expenditure. So it's all of us Ghanaians. People say that we want those things. We don't. The politicians come and tell us, you want this, we are going to give it to you so that we have projects and they come back. The Bank of Ghana thing, mm. my problem is this. It's one of the few institutions that has some credibility outside. The mistake Bank of Ghana did, and I think it was a big one, when they felt that the government has run out of money, it was going bankrupt, mm -hmm. what they should have done was call the chairman of the finance committee in parliament, the minority spokesman, to lunch and tell them, this is where we are. If we don't print the money and give it to them, there will be teachers, people on the streets. The false republic will be dead. We want to maintain the democratic dispensation. What we are going to do, we are going to give money. If President Kufo and Paul Aqua had not capitalized Bank of Ghana, we wouldn't have yeah. had the money to do what we are doing. Mm -hmm. So the crisis we are in is not small. Ghanaians are patient. For one of the times, the IMF uh, managing that told us, you are in big crisis. You are no different from Sri Lanka. That's what he said. We are always, people are always surprised. When Kwesibuchi was trying to raise electricity price very high, the IMF guys told him, don't do it. There will be crisis on the streets. Kwesibuchi said, we'll try it. Because sometimes we hide behind the IMF to do the difficult thing we want to do that we are afraid to do. We did it. The IMF guy was surprised. He said, Nothing happened. There wasn't a whimper when the prices went up. In other places in Asia, they would have come with clubs oh, out. Yeah. So what we are saying is that the crisis we are in now is difficult. Historically, there's never been any country which has gone this way that has survived because it hasn't happened. I don't know of it. When the UK had war, they issued bonds, consuls. Mm -hmm. It took about 40 years, 50 years. Every uh, British man, even Colin, were prepared to buy it as an act of patriotism. Yeah. But uh, which act of patriotism am I going to do to contribute to bonds? Look, I was a young officer in the Ministry of Finance when we were trying to encourage people to put their money in the banks. Bank. Story. This Bush Ashanti man uh, goes to put his money in the bank. He goes there, put it there, they put the guys count, they put it on the other side, and as though they are giving a piece of paper, they're taking your money. Then the other girl, someone has come to cast some money, so she can't. But say, eh, Missika no no, no, yes, yes, you will so we did. Eh, Missika no no no, that's my money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bring it back. It took us a long time to get them to put it there. Now we've made it impossible. That's why people have money in their houses. It's the only place that is safe. The banks are not safe. And we said, open a bank account, put your dollars there so that when you are traveling, you can take a little bit and go and spend it. You say, I can't do that. I live in the bank outside. When I get to New York, I get to London, I sign a check and collect my money and spend. Why are we reversing that? So the problem that Bank of Ghana should have told people and said, yes, 
And once they've told you in confidence, mm -hmm. you can't go and talk about it outside. So that, that, that meeting that you were, you, you were expecting that the Central Bank should have convened? They would have convened. done it. They didn't do it. They, they would kept defending. We haven't printed anything. Yeah. That's bad. And, and, and this was done without parliamentary approval from what we do know now. And, and so are you saying that that meeting could have averted what we are seeing now? Or they were just supposed to alert the finance committee chair that, you know what, we're, we're going to print money. Yeah. Was, that, was that really the sure. solution? We are going to print money. And, uh, because, look, if you are printing money, if, if what is being said is that you are printing money mm -hmm. and that is causing the inflation, yes. why are you increasing the interest rate? Mm -hmm. Which is impacting on the private sector. Because the, you increase it when it is the private sector that we're doing it to inflict pain on them. So your monetary policy rate is 30 percent. You know that policy rate. All that it says is that to us, be careful. We don't trust Minister of Finance. It's like Minister of Finance is pouring water on the floor. Bank of Ghana has a mop mopping it, and they say these guys they are going to increase pouring the water, so I'm mopping it. That's all that the monetary policy retails us. means we don't trust them. But you are the guy who is now putting the money there. So why are you increasing the monetary how, policy rate? How, how bad is the situation, actually? Because now, I mean, you talk about the Bank of Ghana and issues of credibility. We've seen what's happened to the commercial banks and, and the impact that this financial sector cleanup and so on has impacted on the, the confidence in, in the sector. Now, this is the regulator also finding itself in this situation of violating laws that they actually punish the commercial banks for. How dire is this? It is very difficult. The Romans had to say, who, who guards the guardians? You know, you put at the gate mm -hmm. of Rome. The gate on the financiers of Bank of Ghana, insurance company. So if they cannot maintain a certain level of prudence. Uh, that, that's why I'm saying that the problem is dire. And some of these things should not be public discussion. Mm -hmm. It should be behind the scenes. Because the people outside, they are taking a look at us. Normally, when you have an IMF program, immediately you sign. The big boys are in the room. The boys will behave. The economy starts picking up. Investors start coming in. Now. It's not happening. Why? Because the problem, as I see it, historically, I've been seeing it before anywhere in the world. Not seen it before. What's happening no, in this country? What is happening in this country and how we are going to get out of it? The business community doesn't seem to realize that because when they were negotiating, the association of bankers was negotiating for the banks. Are there shareholders in the banks? No. A lot of our association, AGI, all this, they don't have enough research capacity, economists, accountants, helping them to confront government when government is making uh, the policies. And the policies are dire. If you take a look at our banks now, a lot of them are insolvent. Why? Because they've been given a haircut. Why? Because government overborrowed. And the contractors, if you see a lot, some of the banks were getting into trouble. Yes. Because they lend money to contractors. Mm -hmm. The government doesn't pay the contractors. And then where does it end up? Then the banks, they say, write it off. You are impaired. Go and look for new capital. And when you are looking for new capital, they say, OK, uh, you have three months. If I'm an outsider and want to buy the bank cheap, you say I have three months, I'll wait until three days before the three months and say I'm buying your bank at 50% of your uh, uh, the yeah. capital. Normally, you buy it, you take a look at it about two times, three times mm -hmm. uh, the assets that they have. Yeah. But they want to buy it cheap. So we are in a crisis. And the earlier we acknowledge that, and that's all Ghanaians, tighten your seat belts because we are in a crisis, it will be better for us. Professor Bopin, so and I'll bring you at this point because if you look at and, and the reasons why the Bank of Ghana went on the path of shutting or closing down some financial institutions, including commercial banks, withdrawing licenses. You talk about issues of, of corporate governance mm. and, and, and non-performing loans. 
issues about credit risk and, and related party lending. Those are some of the reasons why they closed down the, the banks in about two or three years ago. They are committing the same sin, are they not? Except that they are the central bank. And so they, they will go scot-free? The law, I'm not a lawyer. Sometimes you feel that the law is made for others. Okay. And therefore, in terms of how we respect the law, has some kind of levels. Uh, and I agree with um, a senior economist here. I respect him a lot. Um, it was very clear to me from the third quarter of 2021, and if you check the trajectory, you will see that our poster changed how we saw government and government policy, especially from the third quarter of 2021. Our conclusion, I wasn't the only person, uh, together with the Imani guys, mm -hmm. by Simmons and the others, that look, Ghana was heading dangerously, that something needed to be done. Okay. And we felt that the optimal time for us to have reached out to the IMF was actually from the third quarter of 2021. We want to look at the fiscal vulnerabilities. We want to look at the measures you had put in place. We want to look at how COVID, how we monetized COVID, right? I'm saying that we commercialized the virus. Okay, so the abuse and all of that coupled with 2020, 2020 election, it was very clear. And mostly because we had been there before. You look at how we operationalized the 2012 election and the fiscal deficit after the 2012 election. The deficit was more than 12%, around 12.1%. The current account deficit was in double digits, right? In fact, this money printing didn't start today. It didn't start today. No. And just as Mr. PM said, you know, for, for inflation targeting, which we had adopted mm -hmm. during the time of Dr. Paul Aqua. Okay, unofficially, we started inflation targeting March 2002, mm -hmm. officially 2007. One key requirement for inflation targeting to be effective is fiscal discipline. Indeed. Once you deny the central bank fiscal discipline, there is no way they can deploy monetary policy effectively to bring down inflation and engineer growth. You can't undo this. Now, what did we do? Because of the fiscal dominance, and I'm saying this so that we're able to talk about it objectively, mm -hmm. because when it comes to this money printing, there is none holy. No, not one. Not the NDC, not the MPP. Mm -hmm. Because we saw abuse in, towards the end of 2011, all the way to 2012. The deficit financing from Bank of Ghana in 2012 was more than 40%. Meanwhile, at that time, the Bank of Ghana Act only allowed 10% of the previous year's fiscal revenue. That's what is in the Bank of Ghana Act. Look, as a developing country, we certainly can't do without some level of financing from the central bank. Because the way we see the central bank is more than just being policy sovereign. It's more than just being doing policy, monetary policy, or regulation. They also embrace certain developmental pushter. Right. So this zero financing that the IMF is... It's not sustainable. Asking, it's not sustainable? It's not sustainable. We have to design something that works for us. But the IMF saw something. That's why they Look, even made that demand, does it not? Because of the inflationary pressures, right? And Mr. Piano spoke about that. You are trying to increase your policy rate to contain inflation, and you are effectively undoing that by injecting more liquidity through printing. That's a negative Right. Okay, so if you want to, you are looking, the IMF comes in within the shortest possible time and they want results. So you are looking at the most effective instruments to use. And what is the most effective way to do this, bring inflation down, go to zero financing? You know, it's just like the way we do wage increment. A certain level of wage increment with some level of productivity will not cause inflationary pressures. Right. Beyond a certain point, you begin to see wage inflation. So a certain level of financing by the central bank, especially if it goes to the productive sectors of the economy, certainly the inflationary pressures will be mute if the fiscal side is responding appropriately. Now, what we see in Ghana, and I, I learned to what Mr. Pierney said, instead of pursuing, looking at monetary policy and uh, fiscal policy being complementary to each other, 
we have deployed monetary policy as subordinate to fiscal policy. What have we done? What we have done essentially, and it's not just this regime, we are a bit concerned about what happened now because of proportionality, right? In terms of magnitude, what happened in 2022 is an outlier. It would take us more than three decades. You mean? Right? You know, Ghanaians have no idea where we are and where we are heading towards. And if we don't ask for the right leader, you know, in all of these things, because leadership first failed. Hmm. Okay, and Ghana's problem is not economics. The textbook, there's nothing wrong with the textbook. We can contextualize the knowledge. Our problem is largely governance. It is the governance failures that is manifesting explicitly in economic mismanagement, Absolutely. financial improprieties, procurement breaches, and the rest of them. It's the governance. If the problem is largely governance, the solution cannot be financial or economic. It has if, to be governance. It must be governance. governance. We have to reform. Look, Ghanaians, uh, TUC, the rest of them, look, we can restructure our bonds on a weekly basis. If we don't solve the governance issue, we will come back to this table. What is happening right now, if you look at it carefully, mm -hmm. what is happening is that since 1992, you see the governance cost rising. Okay, and today it's far better for you to join politics and break even than to be in private sector or in pure public service. That inequality is not good. Now, so you see everybody, people are using their business to do politics. Okay. Mm -hmm. People, people, are willing, people are willing to sacrifice for their political party than to sacrifice for Ghana. Because once the party wins, once you win power, you won everything. You've won the knowledge, you've won wisdom, you've won everything. But it doesn't work that way. Based on your assessment the of best idea that. may not be in the head of the head, right? Mm -hmm. We need everybody. So, but that's what is happening. So we need, a, we need to come to the table in a, in a certain national conversation and say that how do we make our democracy work for ourselves? Because as it stands now, the democratic dividend doesn't trickle down to the ordinary person. It doesn't. It doesn't. So we need to save Ghana's democracy from itself. That is different from proposing alternative. Democracy is not one size fits all. Indeed. How do we make it work for ourselves? Mm -hmm. And largely you want to come to the governance cost. Okay, you see what uh, Tinibu is doing in Nigeria, right? He's, he's also started appointing ministers like his colleagues somewhere. <laughs> you, you understand that? Okay. okay, so the governance cost, governance reforms, which may also require revision to the constitution and the rest of them, is very important because what, you, what has happened to Bank of Ghana, it could have happened to anyone that, who was there. Okay. They could have come, anyone who was at, at that point in the central bank. The, the, look, let me things tell you could have been done differently. The optimal in, thing for the governor of Bank of Ghana was to have resigned long ago. Oh, the governor should have resigned Ooh, long ago. You've waited too long. Absolutely. And that would have sent the right signal. You know, when you said that call the minority majority and the rest of them, you want to come to the table and say there has to be some trade-offs. We'll do some printing, but on condition that you're also going to do ABC. Exactly. When, look, in Cote d'Ivoire, in April 2002, the president of Cote d'Ivoire took a decision to reduce the number of ministers from 41 to 32. I'm talking about Cote d'Ivoire, our neighbors. Inflation in Cote d'Ivoire is around 3.2 or 3.5 percent. Of course, we can see marginality because of the, they use the pegged currency. The pass-through of exchange rate to price development is low compared to Ghana, and therefore they are imported inflation and the rest of that. You see marginality. But you see that Leadership has, we, we, we fail to respond. We fail to respond. And that's what's continued to this point. Yes. You say based on your assessment, it's going to take, what, 30 years <laughs> for us to get out of this at situation? Least. <laughs> you know, <laughs> at least, at no. least 30 years. Do you know what it, thinks, what, it, what it means like to render the central bank balance sheet negative like this? We are exposed. As a country, we are exposed. Remember, the central bank is the bank is the lender of last resort. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. Tell me. You know, whilst the IMF was advising us to restructure our debt as a prior action, right? Mm -hmm. The IMF said that their debt, together with the World Bank, the multilateral debt, as at the end of 2022, the total multilateral debt owed to the IMF, the World Bank, and the other multilateral institutions was $8.8 .8 billion. Then the IMF said that because they were the lender of last resort. 
their debt was not up for restructuring. Because as the lender of last resort, it was not good that their balance sheet would take a hit. Because mm. if every country runs into trouble and all of that, where would they go to? They will go to the IMF. And therefore, we, they needed to preserve their balance sheet here. Our central bank is the lender of what? Last, last resort. Last. That principle didn't apply here. Now, because the government didn't make a lot of progress with the domestic debt restructuring, the first round, when we celebrated that it was successful, it was not. Because the eligible bonds at the beginning, mm -hmm. December 5th, was $137 billion. By the time we we're done with the first round, the, eligible, the universe of eligible bonds had reduced to 98 billion cities. Out of that, we were only able to restructure 85% of that at various interest rates. So the average yield coupon rate came to about 9.3%. So we had just restructured around 83 billion cities of the total bonds. That tells you that there was, we didn't get the fiscal savings that we wanted. So we knew that government would do a second round. They would do a third round. At that time, we knew that the cocoa bill, that was around 8.1 billion end of 2022. Mm -hmm. the, the local dollar denominator component around $800 million. Talk about the pensions, 29.2 billion CDs. Then Bank of Ghana. As at the end of 2022, the, the exposure of the central bank to the government was 77.6 billion CDs. 77.6 billion CDs. Okay, so now, at the end of the day, because we had an end game, fiscal sustainability, debt sustainability, IMF set a cutoff point, 2028, with the progress we had made, there was no way, and we knew that there was no way Ghana was going to attain the debt sustainability. Mm -hmm. So in all, in all the configurations, we had to use Bank of Ghana's balance sheets as a shock absorber. And, and the excellence is that they had to take a residual position yes. so that... They, they would absorb they the They had to load the impact. So Bank of Ghana took a deeper haircut than any other investor. And what's Even the a consequence haircut of the that? Principle. The consequence is, is that worthless balance sheet they publish. It's a worthless balance sheet. Your, your total liabilities far exceed your total assets. You no, know, the losses. Even if you say the Bank of Ghana makes annual profit of let's say 1 billion CDs. Certainly, they won't recapitalize everything. You look at how long it will take. Typically, we would have said that the government would have to recapitalize the central bank. Mm -hmm. But the same government is already in a bailout arrangement. So the central bank needs a bailout from a government that is already in a bailout arrangement with the IMF and every Ghanaian. We are all bailing out the government. And you the have bonds. You have bonds, you are bailing out the government by taking a haircut. You are a taxpayer. Look at the number of taxes. Today, if you stand, you are paying tax. If you sit down, you are paying tax. If you sleep, you are, you are paying tax. <laughs> OK? <laughs> no. what, what does that leave in the commercial banks? Because they are also now having to fall on the lender of last resort, who is no, also it means that they can't go there. needing a bailout In all of this, it actually undermines the moral authority of the central bank in regulation and everything. I mean, if any bank goes wrong, they cannot crack the whip. Not that they cannot. When we talk about moral suasion and the rest mm -hmm. of them, you know, it's inbuilt. You understand that? So you want, you know, the essence of regulation is not like to hold a hammer and treat everything like a nail. The essence of regulation is to generate confidence, mm -hmm. trust in the system, both from your actions and inactions and all of that. So I think let's not underestimate what has happened. Uh, we can sympathize with the situation because what you see on the books of Bank of Ghana is, is representative of the level of crisis that we are having to deal with. We haven't seen anything like that in our, in our, in our, in our history. Okay, so we, 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 need to, we need to have a national conversation. One, because typically one of the institutions you want to protect is the central bank. We don't do politics with the central bank. And that is why I felt that the governors sold their birth right in the first place, right? Mm. They overexposed themselves to the central bank. Okay. And therefore, mm. they, they comprom we compromised the operational independence of the central bank. There's a history to this. Mr. Kwan spoke about it also, right? Mm -hmm. And all of that. You can examine the period that Dr. Polakwa was governor of Bank of Ghana. And you can look at the level of independence they fought for, which also enabled them 
recapitalization reforms and all of that. We, we are not seeing that. We haven't mm -hmm. seen that after that. Okay? Mm -hmm. And therefore, we, you know, this whole thing of fiscal dominance and the rest of them, we have to have a national conversation around this and see how we can protect certain national institutions. You know, there are some institutions that when they mention, mm -hmm. you know, it gives hope to the country. You yes. don't do politics. I don't think UK would do politics with University of Oxford. Yes. Oh. No. The way we are doing with our national institution, I don't think they would do politics with the Bank of England or the US Fed and the rest. Of, there are some institutions that when you mention, it gives hope that we can mirror. Okay, so to allow this cannibalization, I think, I think it's, it's um, beyond a certain point, we want to come home and say that how do we build forward better? That's going to be the next question for, for you. But, uh, Mr. Kwan so, I mean, how has the weakness in the sanctioning regime also contributed to this gross violation of the law by the central bank? which has landed us in this deep crisis, which Professor Bokrin says is going to take us at least 30 years to come out of. I think we are, we are talking about a national uh, problem. You know, there is a certain uh, attitude in Ghana, uh, take it or leave it, I'm the boss. And it happens. You go to any uh, company, the messenger at the gate has the same attitude, take it or leave it. Goes all the way through and goes all the way up. I am in charge, take it or leave it. I'm not listening to you. All our institutions is there. And I think it's time we come and say, we want to be a country of laws, that the rules are there. We'll buy. The first thing we do, we've passed the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Yes. That we don't do. When the problem was coming, we suspended it. Mm -hmm. It's like building a car with brakes. You are going down the hill, and it's okay, I take off the brakes. It doesn't make sense, you know. And uh, if you have a fiscal, when IMF was talking about this zero lending, we told them we shouldn't accept it. You see, what people don't understand is this. The central bank is a bank for the government. So the government has accounts. When a check, the government writes a check on an account. There's no money, Bank of Ghana put it in. So we take it, this is the level. So at a time when cocoa revenues, other revenues are not in, government doesn't have money. So we go under the curve. But the money starts coming in and it's going. Mm. So when you are looking at Bank of Ghana money creation or the money they are putting, you take the end of the year. What happened? So the law said, if Bank of Ghana is going to put in money, let it be 10% of the previous year's yes. revenue because you know it will come. Mm -hmm. Then we say, no, zero. You can't be zero. Because government revenues don't come all at the, at the same time. They are looking for import, looking for this and that. So we need somebody like I need my bank mm -hmm. to give me overdraft when I go down. The difference between me and the government is that when I look for the overdraft, Nyahu Nyahu Tamaklo has money he's not using, so it's there. They give it to me. Mm -hmm. Next time, maybe yours they give to me. Then when I pay, it goes out. For, the, for the, the government, you need to have somebody who smiths over. Otherwise, certain institutions that this is what is there. So if you say zero borrowing from the central bank, we yeah. say, does it make sense mm -hmm. operationally? But we said, okay, we'll do it because we wanted the money. That's right. Then now we say, okay, we have rules. Government, you yourself, there are certain things you cannot do. We have 275 Ghanaians sitting in parliament. Your job is to make sure that every document the Minister for Finance brings. We have financial management regulations and allies. It's very clear. He has to come up with their sustainability. It's as if we found their sustainability only yesterday. It's always been there. You tell us what you are going to do with the money, how it's going to be repaid. 
275. They do nothing. So it's not only the ministry that is as fault. Who were the parliamentarians? They were there. They were passing all the bills. We have a value for money uh, audit. We have procurement. When we were setting up procurement, I told you I was mindful. I said, don't let us do it. The IMF didn't use a, a procurement act because it's just going to be one layer of corruption. The procurement So you system. go, you pay, it's given it to you. And then value for audit. The contractors know. Okay, value for audit, I, you go cut it by uh, 5%, give us 3%, and lose two. So that's also another gutter for people collecting money. I prefer we don't have the procurement act. Throw it away. When the minister for transport goes to buy a Prado and it costs him 100,000, and another person buys one, it costs him 80,000, you call them, why is yours different? Mm -hmm. Why do we need a whole in a procurement, procurement institution? And I see before they even go for a bid, Minister of Health, they say we are building this type of hospital. They have costed it and given it to the uh, contractors. The whole idea of tendering is that give the specification, the scope, and let the people come and bid. And then you say, I'm taking yours because it's cheaper. But the incentive system we set up in the system is that the bigger the project, the better. Because somebody is taking a 10%. So if the thing is cheap, they don't want it. If you are a small Ghanaian contractor, uh, you're uh, 10,000, 100,000, nobody's interested in paying it. So what we need to do, right, let's go back, all of us as Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. It's from our midst that the ministers come. And the strange thing is that somebody is your friend. He becomes a minister. You don't understand him anymore. No. <laughs> you know? The only honest one I had was uh, my friend uh, uh, Kandapa when he was in opposition. Electricity, very important. We destroyed our electricity system. He said whenever NDC wanted to raise the tariff, he said, no, we want affordability, affordability. Then when he became minister for energy, he was going to increase it. I said, Kan, but what happened? He said, well, when I was in opposition, I thought affordable was spelled with one F. But I know no, that it's, it's spelled with two F. Worse. <laughs> Why are we pampering Ghanaians who have access to electricity here by saying pay less than the cost? Why are we pampering Ghanaians like us? You close your eyes, you turn the pipe, the water is coming. In my village, they have to walk to go and get the water. And you say, me? You are subsidizing me. Why? So I can use the water for my grass to wash my car. When we are thinking of if development was from bottom there, you find out that the things we will be talking about mm -hmm. is why is this water red? Why are there no gutters? I don't want Ghana to become a developed nation like some of the other countries we mentioned them, where there's a flood and people are dying. You go to uh, even Korea, mm -hmm. some of the accommodation people are in. We don't want that. You go to America, very risk country, and there are people walking on the street begging you to buy them lunch when there's enough money for everybody to go around. So I want Ghana, maybe we get to $3,000 per capita income. That's the only time when people are paying taxes and government revenue can begin to go up. We don't want to go more. We don't want to create billionaires. Maybe a couple of millionaires. And so we as a people have to think and say, do we have a vision? Lee Kuai Yung had a vision. He did. And Kuma had a vision. Came to one point, he knew he needed electricity to do whatever he wanted to do. But now, since then, in between, the vision, even when we have a vision, Ghana beyond it, fantastic vision to have rivaled in Krumas. Uh, one district, one factory, I didn't take it as a, a program. I took it as an agenda to say that we are looking towards a future where 
every district will be able to host a factory. Why are there no uh, factories in a district? It isn't rocket science. There's no electricity. If somebody comes from England to set up a factory in my village, are there schools where his children can go to? There are no schools. When the wife turns or the spouse turns, will the water be flowing? No. When you close your eyes, you turn the uh, electricity. You turn the knob. There will be no uh, power going. There's no three-phase electricity. So the agenda was that by a certain time, every district will have all this infrastructure to do. The web, wide web, so that access to internet. internet. You see what is happening to us here? It has to be affordable and cheap. If it's affordable and cheap, you and I can sit here and be watchmen in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. He can sit here and do an operation, assist my daughter to do an operation there. Because you have access, it's broad, the broadband is good, it's accessible, and it's affordable. So let's now sit back. This crisis gives us an opportunity to change things. They say change the paradigm, mm -hmm. change our mentality, and so on. The laws, if the laws are there, and you can be caught, and the police and the judiciary are doing their work, you can be imprisoned. Ghanaians, we are one of the most law-abiding. And they say when fish is gotten rotten, where does it start? From the head. From the top. If you have the top there, your boss is not taking a bribe, you'll be scared to take a bribe because they'll be monitoring you. So let's get the laws, let them be working, and when the judges are giving good judgment, let's support them. Yes, we, don't, we overload the judiciary. There are political issues that should be solved politically among us. You shouldn't go to overburden a young and fledgling uh, judiciary. Uh, judiciary. We shouldn't do that. Let us solve our political problems ourselves. If things are going wrong, fortunately for Ghana, we are probably the only one with three living presidents. Can they get together? Call the chairman of their parties, the general secretaries, chairman of the council of elders, and say, let's sit down. This country is not going right. Or the tra traditional rulers, all of them collective, call the leaders and say, hey, we don't like the way this country is going. They are the people who, who own this land. But if you open your mouth and talk, you won't eat. So immediately you open your mouth, somebody's slipping bread into your mouth. But th that's another breath of it. So, but you as well, and I'm sure Dr. Nyawanda, you can say the same. Have you tried, for instance, reaching out to the president, tell him, look, all is not well, as you have been saying? What has been the well, response? I'm surprised you're asking this question because I have done it. <laughs> I remember that it's been a, and, and let me make this clear here. I don't have anything against Akufuad. I've known Akufuad when we were small, small boys. Mm -hmm. I've studied him carefully. I was one of his stalwarts to get him to the forefront of the party. In fact, in fact when Kwame was disqualified, and at the same time, Tukufo couldn't beat Jerry John Rawlings in the first election. Some of us decided, OK, if Kwame is not going, then let's back Akufuado. I see. And we genuinely supported him. Without some of us, there was no way he could have won the election. Really? I'm not talking about the general election. I mean, mm. win the position to lead the party. Mm. Now, when he became leader of the party, I noticed some changes in him. I said, oh, maybe it's too, he's not excited, he knows he's going to be president one day. But when we had a party congress in Tamale, and we picked, not we picked, we elected a national chairman of the party. We elected a general secretary of the party. And also the second national chairman of the party. We elected. Because we elected people, not appointed yes. by anybody. Then not quite after that.
These three guys were prevented from entering into their own offices at the party headquarters. Why? I'm saying something, so just be, mm -hmm. listen to me. And the reason was quite simple, that they were hobnobbing with the NDC. Oh, how? I, was, I know that was not true. Then like a joke, a mob was organized and chased them out of their offices. Then followed with dismissal or indefinite suspension from the party. Can you believe a democratic party? Honestly, I came out and gave it not only to the party, but to Kofado himself. And this is what brought or broke the camel's back between myself and him. Then, a week later, the National Council met, and the discussion was that I should be suspended. Reasons were asked by certain people. Mm -hmm. They could not come out with a reason. But one gentleman who was then the regional minister of uh, Greater Accra, I think he's even passed on now, he boasted that he could sign the letter. Because the top couldn't sign my, this, my, my, my letter. suspension letter. So they brought it down to the regional level at Accra where we have struggled to build years ago, years, years ago. And then he came out with a letter that I have been suspended from the party indefinitely, just like they did to the national chairman. Mm -hmm. And the reason was, of late, I have been coming out with statements that are not in conformity with the party's policies. Can you believe that? <laughs> so I said, oh, did that be the case? Then we shall, we shall fight on. Because I joined that party, I believe in it because the people like Kwame Pieni, they believe in democracy. Look, we were having a Congress one time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Kwame probably can remember. But then Darocha was the head of the party. Right. Then Kwame came to sit with me. We were chatting. Then B.J. Darocha was having an argument with the section of the people. Then Kwame said, let me go there quickly before they swallow BG. <laughs> he went to solve the problem. I see. You see? Mm -hmm. Now, the moment I took that stance that I believe in, that let me speak my mind. That's right. I don't care. After I've been to prison twice. Not because I stole anybody's property. Mm -hmm. But because of this nation, Ghana, what have I got out of it? Nothing. Nothing. He went to prison over 10 years. Just imagine it all. 10 years in prison. Plus, I left him in Sawam. Right. <laughs> I went to Britain. When I came back, he's been sent to... Is this up or where? Mm -hmm. I, I drove to Anomabu to go and visit. I mean, it's so pathetic. And then, when you think you are struggling so that this nation goes forward, Younger people who are coming, instead of following the full stuff, the full steps of such brilliant giants in the party, you see them rather looking for money. When, when you reached out to the president with your suggestions, what was the response? I didn't reach out to him. After the election, or before the election, a couple of hours before the election, I have even retired to bed. When my boy told me that he said a bell rang, so I said, Well, he should go and find out who what that was. He said, The man claimed he's a journalist. That was on the 6th December 2016. So I said, Should I talk to this journalist or not? Then something told me, Talk to him. So I got up, got my rifle. I, 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 I don't take chances in life, you know. He brought the rifle. He, 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 of course, the boy didn't see it. I sat down before he came in. So I had the rifle by my side. He didn't see it. But when he came, make looking, even if he comes to physical, he can never, never bring me down. Well, he asked about elections in this country since the time of Kwame Nkrumah and how Kufuor managed to, you know. And I said, Kufuor listens. 
I saw that. Kufuor lessons. Because Kufuor was able to come to power because he listened. The first round, he couldn't get it. It was the second round, if you remember. Yes. He was able to convince the other smaller parties. And that, is, that was what brought us the victory that we had for Kufuor to become leader. But even Kwame criticizes anybody. That doesn't mean he hates you. So when it got, then, then he posed a question on Akufado, how do I see the coming election? And I made a play. I told him, look, young man, if you guys voted Akufado in, the sort of, if, I, I can't even quote myself now. I said, the, the bitterness that you have, you never forget. Why did you say that? Why did I say that? Mm -hmm. Because I knew he can't handle this country. You knew then that he can't handle this country? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, look, I knew straight after the dismissal of Paul Afoko. When they are 14, yet the boy won the elections. I knew that my friend has shifted from the democratic path. Such a person can never run this country. This country, you know somebody who is knowledgeable and at the same time will be in position to think and handle the council carefully. And me, my target was him. You and, the court, and the Supreme Court, by the, was it Chagan who was the, 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 I think Chagan or somebody. They disqualified him. And it's so painful because this man went to prison because he was trying to unseat a military covenant, which I have done before. I, myself, and four, three other officers went one day to unseat General Champ in 1977. 70, yeah, 77. And that landed us in prison. For two years plus, that destroyed everything I have, destroyed my family, everything. So how can I go for the one we have fought to get? Then not quite long after that, Rollins came in. My God, another problem. I left this country, was out in the U.S. for four solid years. I came back. I, I, I thought maybe things might, might have cooled down a bit. No. Not quite long after, I went in again. <laughs> you follow me? Yes. So right. I have studied my friend, and I know that he is not a Democrat, as he claims to be. President Kufuado is not. No, he's not. He is not. He can yeah. come and challenge me. I say he is not. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Nyaho Tamaklo, I have my guests. Um, we'll, we'll go to the um, guests in studio. I have the Association of Ghana Industries and also the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry as well. Um, and the way forward, really. There have been suggestions by the Kwan PNM and Professor Bobkin and then also. Uh, Professor Conrad from Pombo and Dr. Nyal Tamaklo, on the way forward, what has to be done differently to get different results? Now to my guest in studio. Let me start off with um, the AGI. Yeah, so Adubia. Adubia. Yeah, Adubia Sebamboaji for AGI. Um, I must say that uh, for me it has been a history lesson. <laughs> uh, we've learned quite a lot and so much uh, has been said during the discussion. And so we don't intend... Uh, going repetitive and reiterating what has been said earlier. Um, however, as industry, um, the way forward is to just caution governments that even as individuals, we ask for feedback. We ask for constructive feedback. And so when some of these feedback come, it should not be taken as uh, an attack, but rather... Um, a constructive review for government to put us back on the right path. And then again, um, I think from what has been discussed so far and what um, we know, after Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, we haven't really seen any industrialization drive for Ghana. Uh, we have had statements of hope, given indications that we would want to industrialize. But each time we say that we rather see policies that contradict that's very assertion. And so we are hoping that 
with this, where we find ourselves, if there's any truth in the statement that necessity is the mother of inventions, mm -hmm. then we expect that with this obscure situation we find ourselves in, we should rock the boat and take that bold decision to industrialize our nation. Because if private sector is the engine of growth, then we need to support private sector, we need to support industrial sector to be able to produce and help with the fiscal uh, revenue. Now, with where we are heading to, we realize that uh, most of our efforts is rather being put into revenue mobilization mm -hmm. as against uh, expenditure uh, rationalization. And so we expect that if Cote d'Ivoire could reduce their ministers from 40, 41, to 41 to 32, 42. we have 100 and what? Or we have reduced? I have well, lost count. Over, no, I have actually lost count. It's over 80. 80. Yes. We, can, we can reduce further. We would want, we are in, we are in this all together. And if we, as industries, we, we are, we are suffocating, we are crashing. Some of industries are folding up. Let's not forget that Ghana is not the only nation one can invest in. And so even if we have political stability to attract uh, investment, there are other options. And I must confess that some companies are looking at our neighboring countries Good where one. they have, um, manufacturing concerns to rather relocate because the environment here is not helpful. And so we should take that bold decision and do the right thing. Mm -hmm. I would also want to talk about the bribery and corruption. Sometimes uh, we, we, we make it seem as if it's a myth, but we know it is not a myth, it's a reality. And way back, while we were preparing for this, I saw uh, an old paper posted, 1971. Uh, Monday, March 22, 1971. And this is Dr. Buzia. I'd like to read it. Uh, he says, and this is the paper. The heading is bribery. Our main problem, says Buzia. He said, bribery and corruption have eaten so deep into the very fabric of the society that when you put anybody in position of trust, he or she uses that position to amass wealth. Mm. Ghana, he said, was faced with the task of rebuilding the nation and asked how he could build the nation alone if the people continue to be selfish and dishonest. Retreating his call on Ghanaians to discipline themselves, the premier deplored the way and manner Ghanaians spent all their right. money on right. drinks. So we started drinking, not today. It's mm. been there for ages. Corruption and bribery started not today. 71 till now is 52 years. <laughs> and so if we sit and we still talk about corruption, it means that indeed it is a problem and we have yeah. to look at it. Yeah. Now we realize that with our projects, we are so much interested in big projects like um, Mr. Right. Rami Penim said, with procurement. And what goes with procurement? Uh, we heard it was kickbacks, now it is front kick, it is back kick. And so what we want to say is that if there is no expectation of coming back to say thank you, there will be no allocation made in contracts. So we should change. What we see is more of a reflection of our society. This is what Ghana has become. Because even at the lower levels, when somebody gives you a job, they expect you to come back to say thank you. Some institutions, some industries are making efforts. If you go to the banks, you can see uh, posters there that thank you is enough. It's about time we say thank you is enough. And when we right. are doing projects, we should consider the nation Ghana. Mm. Because if the mess we find ourselves in is going to take about 30 years for us to fix, then I don't know what we are leaving for the next generation. Mm. And so um, we should look at that and equally work on our raw material exports. Fortunately, I saw an article right. yesterday, Daily Graphic President saying that he's moving from raw material exports and retail uh, trading to modern uh, exports, something of the sort. We export <laughs> cocoa, we export bauxite. Meanwhile, we need aluminum in this country. And then we import the uh, ingots. We export rubber. 
But we need rubber products in this country. We import the granules after the rubber has been processed to use for manufacturing. How can private sector, how can industries make it? Right. So let's take advantage. And finally, coming from the automotive sector, mm -hmm. it would be disastrous for me not to mention that. Uh, with the auto policy and how we have started with assembly plant, I think it's about time we start considering the local content. Right. We have rubber, we can go into ties. Uh, Professor Frimpong Boateng mentioned the lithium is right. another opportunity, and we have glass. Finally, okay. my statement is that government should liaise with academia. Mm -hmm. We have so many people in Ghana with doctorate degrees. Correct me if I'm wrong, Professor Bokpin and uh, Dr. Eduan Anienchi. Doctorate right. is a research program. When they do the research, what happens okay. to them? They sit on our shelves and gather dust. Mm -hmm. Government should liaise with academia, use the research, and let's use it to fix the nation, Ghana. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Please, let's put our hands together for the AGI, Association of Ghana Industries. Um, also, I'll come to the Nana Chamber of Commerce and Industry shortly. But on, on the crisis, because everything that the AGI is concerned about is hinged on how to get out of this crisis situation that we find ourselves in. You've talked about the central bank governor should have resigned or gone a long time ago. Zepin, in ensuring that this does not happen again so that there is some level of accountability, would you also go on the same path, that someone needs to be held responsible? In, in the mind of Professor Bob King, the governor should step aside. Would you also ask the same? No. Uh... First of all, having studied uh, the dossier uh, well enough, mm -hmm. I believe that people should be allowed to grow. You make a mistake, the, making a mistake should not be fatal if you learn lessons from it. Okay, in Ghana, we are, we are too used to uh, getting rid of people, you know, Age comes with experience. You've been seeing it before. A lot of people, they think things are new. If the representative from uh, AGI had not read that paper, she wouldn't have known mm -hmm. because we are not teaching our history. Buzia admitted it. The current generation, we don't admit things. I'm and sorry. worse for us, I'm sorry. you know, you have the social media, which reverberates and expands things. So a little thing becomes very big. And that's where the concern is, that the Bank of Ghana is saying that this is as a result of the DDEP, what they are going through now, which quite clearly all of you have proved that that is not really the reason why we are yeah, in this particular crisis and the situation that we find so ourselves you are, in. So you are there. Let us all admit, and the first time the Minister for Finance admitted that we are in a crisis was during this statement in Red to Parliament. Before that, we were not. It was COVID. It was Ukraine war. If planting for food and jobs, the Minister for Finance had put the money there and we are planted, maybe you and Prof. bread for breakfast. Nyaho and Frimpon Boatin may be happy with their banku oh, yeah. and some fish. No, I want to join them. <laughs> you want to join them? For, for that breakfast. So <laughs> the Russian-Ukraine war will not have any effect on us because the maize will be yeah, there. That's right. Okay? Yeah. If all the time we're talking, planning for food, fertilizer, uh, we had used the gas or the cocoa has for fertilizer, it will not affect us for seven years. I was shocked when the government came in, they were going to change from the gas where they come, and then they started saying, we are importing 400 million, this and that. <laughs> what was happening in the four years? We've been saying that a long time ago. It's action, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I think, you from know, Frimpo and statement has not even sunk in on us. You invest in people, not in projects. The items that are sitting on the desk, on the desk in CSIR. We made proposals once. If you're a professor, you are working for CSIR, there's something lying there. You want to take that job and commercialize it. Asian Bank, 
Agri Development Bank, Ghana Commercial Bank, should finance you. Get two other people to join you. We get you out. You are creating jobs. When you sit and you close down the bank, do you know how many people you've sent? About uh, 300 people have become jobless. Mm -hmm. It's not only that. A whole lot of areas now for the young people in Ghana. We are people who are talented. Soccer, correct? Mm -hmm. We are people who are talented. Boxing, tennis. You see these young people going to, to play, to exercise, 6 a.m. on the turf uh, thing that uh, Magdan had built. Mm -hmm. in, uh, they are enthusiastic. They are going hungry. Morocco, they are minister for finance, minister for sports. You see how well they are uh, doing there. Mm -hmm. You feed them. There's a doctor looking after them. They are physios telling them how to uh, heal very quickly to go back. Millions can come. When this guy who did uh, malaria, he was trying to add an app where you get any drug, mm -hmm. you just put in uh, the thing and then it will be told whether it's genuine or not genuine. My friend, the name has just slipped, old age. It, eh? that, that is, um, I think it's... it's oh, uh, now on, on the money. Bryce, Bryce Simmons. Bryce Simmons. Bryce Simmons. Yes. If Ghana has supported Bryce Simmons and all the WHO medical things that mm. we use, everybody is approved or that we are using, billions will be coming to be more than yeah. cocoa. If we support some of the young people. And a lot yes. of things are happening. So let's take the crisis. Forget about those who are supposed to have made mistakes. Young people say, I'm going to help. In my village, they say, we are very maybe by Yekunjao. When you rush into the war, you die before the war starts. <laughs> but <laughs> fortunately, the governor is there. Let's say you made a mistake. If he made a mistake, how do we correct it? He is the one who can correct it. So let's use, you know. I, people say, ah, but you resign. I could resign. Why? Mm -hmm. I had a job at the UN. I could always come, go back. But I don't think I might have been that bold and brave if I didn't have a job. So let's make sure that the private sector is strong. Once we build a strong private sector, and you don't need a job from the government to survive, a lot of people will become courageous and speak their mind. So let's start now. How do we move from where we are? Let the bygones be bygones. How do we really get a Bank of Ghana that is operationally independent? Yeah, Safa Mafo fought for it. Bank of Ghana to be independent. Say, yeah, what are you talking about? The politicians who are facing election, you think they are less concerned about the people than a governor who is sitting in some air conditioning? He said, no. He was trained by the chairman. As a banker, he says, no, you need central bank independence. It's the history of the Germans after the Second World War. So they trusted the Germans. They trusted their governor of the Federal Bank better than they trusted the Minister for Finance. You take it's the education. Same thing in England. Yeah. The Bank of England. Yeah. But, but, then, yeah. but then see, they can be controlled by the policy. But this one, when you are independent, it doesn't mean you don't consult. There are two independent institutions in Ghana. Bank of Ghana, the PURC, Public Utilities Regulatory mm -hmm. Commission. When they are making their decision based on technical factors, they don't consult anybody. But you can also have that independence and self-censor yourself. So being independent doesn't mean you don't consult, you consult. But you then come back to the human being. Is he strong enough to say no when things are going wrong? Or you just uh, roll over. And all of us, as Ghanaian, will talk mental attitude, change your this and that and that. It's not going to change until we say we are investing in people. What can you do? But to, to the likes of um, Professor Bokke is not alone in this call for people being held responsible for the crisis that we find ourselves in now so that it doesn't repeat itself. Because there's a history to where we are now, this big, but the situation has aggravated to this point we haven't seen in our history before, just as you have indicated. So in taking responsibility, I recall some time ago you, you asked that the finance minister should resign, right? 
was, it was on a, a different level. <laughs> you see, I was, my problem with the Minister for Finance, mm -hmm. and it's not personal, you know, in Ghana, when you raise the thing, it's personal. First of all, raising, borrowing for the government, for Ghana, mm -hmm. and you and your company personally, borrow, personally benefiting. Yes. It means you may not need the money, and you are borrowing it just for yourself, okay? So that was my problem. And then populating the financial service sector with its people from data bank and so on. That's what's wrong. And then nepotism, you know. And that's what I was talking about, that we need to change it. It has never happened before that the minister is in place and is doing that. That was my problem. With the, with the central bank, my issue is that we started wrongly when we said zero uh, lending. And I said, when, I, when the politicians are talking, and I always tell my friends in Bank of Ghana, mm -hmm. do not respond when the opposition leader or the minority finance postman is speaking. They are not talking to you. Let the politician talk. When the people want to hear from you, they will call you to parliament to come and answer their questions. Mm -hmm. So you don't get yourself involved in it. We, we made Bank of Ghana independent so that they would take a look at the numbers and then decide. Uh, I didn't want the Minister of Finance to get involved in foreign exchange management as he was trying to go. And I said, look, stop there. It's a slippery uh, slope. We don't want the management of balance of payments to be done on political basis. But when there is a war and the crisis we are in, it's worse than a war. We don't solve it. It's an economic problem. It becomes a social problem. It becomes a national crisis. Mm -hmm. People get onto the streets. And when people get onto the streets, there's no leader that you can talk to. And all of us, the unions, they are also involved. You have uh, a SNET, where the minister says, if I don't pay for my SNET contribution, 30% they will charge me. Mm -hmm. The Minister for Finance, they collect uh, things that they are supposed to, and then they sit on it. And then it's as if it's a largesse. One of the things I was going to suggest is that we are digitalized. If Ghana Revenue collects the revenue, they say this goes to National Health Insurance Authority. They sit on it, it shouldn't. Automatically, it can be dispersed. District uh, Assembly Common Fund, mm -hmm. it goes there. This one goes there. If it's for COVID, it goes there. It's not there for the Minister for Finance to chop. Uh, Seth was on the line, but he is no longer on the line. Yes. Seth came in, he wants more money. He said, earmark funds, we should stop it. Every economist knows that it's the most inefficient way of distributing money if you earmark it. But we know our people don't respect maintenance. That's why we set up the road fund. Immediately let it go to feed the road so that they are maintaining the roads. When we say that we're paying for the right. oil refinery, we put it there, the money never went. This electricity, we've been paying from it from Kwajuhuhu, and the debt is increasing. The one that was supposed to repay, we made it a debt uh, prevention. We never put it there. So we passed the laws. Let's respect the laws. Uh, Kufo came in, causing financial laws. Mm -hmm. We abolished it. Maybe we shouldn't. Causing financial laws to the state. So that if you cause financial laws to the mm -hmm. state, you become responsible and accountable. Does this instance amount to causing financial laws to the state? I, I don't know. Look, <laughs> uh, uh, there are two things. Incompetence. I, I incompetence. Mm -hmm. To cause... A loss. It has to be that you have, an, uh, uh, the, what the lawyers call menstrual, you had an intention to do something wrong. As I said, if Bank of Ghana poured in all this money, which they claim they are written, because there was a time when the secretary to the bank issued a note that nothing like that was happening. Mm -hmm. I know that because of the up and downs of that, you need the central bank as your banker to be failing the thing. At the end of the year, 
if it's getting too big. And as I said, when they realized that they needed to be able to do what they are doing, you call. But the Minister for Finance says, Bank of Ghana is dead. They are going to cut it in half. Ah, you come and collect money, and then you say uh, 7 billion, 3 billion is lost. Can you imagine what $3 billion can do? Go to your village. Don't give them a billion. Half a million dollars. They can build gutters, build, uh, get uh, uh, solar for the, uh, the, the mm -hmm. place they meet for young people to be able to, to study. What I'm saying is that we should not be uh, too rushed to go to judgment. Let parliament call the governor to explain what actually happened so that he has his day uh, to tell us what happened. And then if what I suspect is what is the truth, that if they hadn't pumped in that money. Or well, some printing of money. The, if they hadn't pumped it in, that we printed money, but we hadn't, there would have been people on the streets swimming in the president's pool, if he has a pool, like they did in Sri Lanka. <laughs> you know, that's why I did that. But to do that, you are not yourself. Bank of Ghana belongs to us, the people. Did you consult the shareholders or who, who approved it? So my concern is that let us wait and get all the information and say now <laughs> when we are moving forward, the laws are there. We don't change our laws because somebody wants to lend money to us. How do we prevent ourselves from getting to a state where we are to go to the IMF? That's what I thought I wanted to talk about. Indeed, and that's going to be your rounding up com um, comments as well on this. So you have some minutes to talk about that. Professor Bocking, see, the, there's a reason why, and you elaborated on it earlier, the independence of the Bank of Ghana was entrenched and actually quite central to the financial sector, the sustainability of the financial sector that we find ourselves in. With what's happened now, that, 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 that has been totally violated, the operational mm. independence of the central bank. What has to be done to ensure that we don't get to this point again? Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, on one breath, one could sympathize with the central bank governors because of the, what we have talked about, fiscal dominance and all of that. There would always be reasons in this country, there would always be reasons and the rest of them. So I think building forward better and inclusively. If you look at the whole thing, I'll still come back to what I talked about mm -hmm. earlier. We've seen an IMF supported program. Uh, we've seen some reforms, but they are not adequate. So urgently what we needed to do is to initiate certain governance reforms. It's a must. And, and the reforms we are talking about is not the same as change in government or one party coming, another party going. You know, we are looking for reforms that cut across regimes, right? Because merely changing one party from the other necessarily may not engineer this. And I think we need a middle class for all of us to speak out and then say that, look, this is how we have to do it. This is the way forward. And we need organized labor. Look, if you look at the history of UK Labor Party and all of that, I think that we are not using... <laughs> look, when the government was talking about debt restructuring, this was our proposal. Let's not the banks negotiate alone. Let's come together. Let's have a domestic creditor committee, right, that sit down with government. Say that you want to bail out from us. These are the conditionalities. The IMF is giving you money, there are conditionalities. The World Bank money that will come will have its own conditionalities. That you know what? We have noticed that given your lifestyle, tax revenue is no longer enough. That's mm -hmm. why you're after our savings and our investment. Yes. We can bail you out today, but if you don't change this lifestyle, tomorrow you'll come back to us. These are the terms. It happened in Jamaica. But you know, because we're doing it individually, the government got away with murder. Mm. Right. That's right. And therefore, we didn't ask for any fiscal reforms in exchange for the, for the lending. Because we had essentially lent to the government through the haircuts and all of that. So seriously, and the urgent thing, we can't wait. Mm. We can't wait for 2024 
to ask for certain governance reforms. It will be too late. It has to start now. It has to start now. Who is not no, making we know the... We, we know we, we said that, look, mm. if Ghana cannot govern with 40 ministers, forget it. Then leave us alone. Okay. 40 ministers. What do you need all those ministers to do what? To take a decision? <laughs> or to do what? You know, if you appoint one econ uh, minister, the economy around that minister is beyond just one person. We are not talking about a slave queen economy around all those. And, uh, no, that's not what we are talking about. <laughs> you understand? Okay, so, and so the point is that at the end of the day, you put the country on the table and you say, look, the governance cost is heavy. We don't have fiscal space for growth enhancing spending. Mm. So if you, and, and we think that the way we can solve this is to in, generate more revenue, that can't be true. Look, if you look at the development path of mm. Malaysia, Singapore, their tax to GDP ratio in the last 25 years, it hasn't been abnormally higher than that of Ghana. Okay, so the, the narrative that we are in this mess because we are not generating enough revenue is not true. Well, look, what Ghana has generated in the last 15 years, tax to GDP ratio, if we were to use it prudently and, 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 and sought for higher value for money and we're able to deal, deal with corruption, this should not be the development outcome. Certainly not. And, and there is no guarantee. Look, in the literature, there is no guarantee that if Ghana generates more tax revenue, we'll suddenly become wise. There's no guarantee. There is no guarantee that, okay, right now we are saying that our tax GDP ratio is, let's say, 13%, and if we're able to increase it to 18.7%, as is in the IMF program, then suddenly we'll become sensible. And we will spend wisely, and there will be less corruption. No. Not at all. So, and the problem is, look, if you look at procurement, you spoke about procurement. And that is why now we are centralizing everything. We are actually centralizing our cent decentralization arrangement and all of that. We have gone back. Look at it this way. So you look at the big ticket procurement transactions, mm -hmm. more than 70% of them are, are done through social sourcing, yeah. not competitive tendering. Right. Then look at the interesting thing. You know those days, if you needed admission for your child, you go and see the headmaster or the headmistress. You, you understand that? And then maybe thank you, not just in West, right? Maybe here and there. Then we said we'll solve that problem. So we have centralized uh, placement. We have actually, all that we've done is to centralize the corruption. We, we didn't remove it. It didn't solve the problem. Look, right now, and right now, what is, you should be concerned. You mm -hmm. see, you know, free senior high school, we, we like the lot, but it's not working. We should be concerned. We said, let's invest in people. We should be concerned that people who are exiting the free senior high school and entering the investors. Okay, mm. you know, today even the politicians themselves are not comfortable sending their children to Fantepim and the others, right? Mm. They are all sending them to the private schools, right? Mm. Because those they wish to cherish a few more time, Fantepim and the rest of them, well, I didn't get a chance to go there, I would have loved. But of course, with the aggregate that God, I'm sure they would have to set up another school for me for somewhere else or something <laughs> like that. Okay, but we, we are destroying certain, I mean, things that we cherish. I hope you understand that. Right. And all that. We've allowed, look, we've politicized Ghana Education Service. They were going to do that with the investors, with the public investors bill, and the rest of them. Why, why, why are we doing that to ourselves? She, it's not helpful. So I think that when I talked about that, if you look at the development literature, mm -hmm. it takes a long time. Consistency. We talk about macroeconomic stability. It's not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. Mm -hmm. That is the dominant school of thought in economics. That for development to happen, you first need to guarantee macroeconomic stability. You check the data. Since 1992, Ghana hasn't moved beyond macroeconomic stability. We've had relative okay. macroeconomic stability and then instability, and then we come back here and there. The cost of restoring macroeconomic stability, macroeconomic stability now is, is so huge. Now, how do we move from here? It's good the IMF program has come. How do we build on that? But to make it sustainable, we need to initiate serious governance reforms. The governance structures must support. And as it stands now, we don't have that. And I think that we need to start that quite quickly. And I'm hoping that the president will do the needful. You know, there has to be a leadership response. Which you haven't, we haven't seen as well. I haven't seen that. It's very important. You see, you needed to do that to generate confidence. You know, sometimes when we talk about the economy, we have the imaginary economy in people's mind. We have the technical economy. We have the economy on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. But building confidence. 
in the economy may not require building a bridge or doing something very major. There are the little, little things that generate hope, that rallies everybody behind. And as it stands now, it's not, we are not seeing that. And I think we need to look at the governance issues. I think at some point that you talked about the constitution and, and all of that, I think we need to go back to the basics. We need to, and then also seriously reduce the governance cost. If you reduce the governance cost and you're able to rake in the savings of about 40%, that's fiscal space. Fiscal space will not be conferred on you by the IMF or whatever. We need to create it. You create that also through that expenditure cut, and that expenditure cut will not hurt growth. In economics, we have some expenditure cut that will hurt growth. We have other expenditure cut that will promote growth. The kind of expenditure cut we are talking about are the ones that will promote growth, free of fiscal space. Then you can invest in the growth-enhancing uh, uh, areas. Well, now we can't do that. Look, there are, if you want to go to Cape Coast today, and you set off in the morning, that will be all that you will do for the day. And traffic will take all your time. You know, economic activity is also about movement. Okay, once you restrict movement, you are inhibiting growth and the rest of them. Look at the hours people spend in traffic just to get to work. And, and it's, it's not sustainable. In fact, the, the interlinkages and all the, the, the challenges that you have actually And then, and then finally, space. because private sector is the engine it's, of growth, look, we need to look at our tax environment. Mm -hmm. Look. It is never true that the more you tax your people, the more you see growth. It's not true. Look, in the other countries, like the Scandinavian countries, where they have high tax rate, in Europe, maybe VAT rate average 21% and the rest of the income levels are high. But if you have a government that is efficient in the delivery of public services, if that government is taking so much from you, you may not complain. But if you have a government that is inefficient, okay, and that government takes so much from businesses and households, and that government is inefficient in the redistribution of that, then there's a problem. We cannot allow that to, 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 to continue. And I think that is where we need to do. There are too many taxes. I've said that our VAT, let's make the VAT and the street levies peg it at below 18%. And then again, there are too many back doors. Look, in Ghana, sometimes we think that we are so smart you put your standard corporate tax rate at 25 percent then you introduce growth and sustainability levy mm -hmm. and so many right now in ghana whether you are making loss or profit you, you are paying taxes when you do that you are actually suffocating the private sector that is the engine of growth bear this in mind the un is telling us that ghana's population by 2040 will be 45 million by 2040 and that population 58 percent of that population will be less than 30 years and the World Bank is telling us that between now and 2040, Ghana needs to create 10 million jobs, in, especially in the former wage economy. You have to look at all these, these statistics, right, which will inform what you do now and, and for the foreseeable future. You have to feel for this country, you know. When you do the modeling, when you look at all these things and you look at what Galamse is doing to our future and you see the rural urban migration, you know, you know, food inflation, depending on where you buy food from, is yeah. higher. Food inflation Indeed. in the Northeast is almost 80%. You sure. see the regional differences. It's more expensive living in the rural areas in some place in Ghana today than the urban areas. Because also because the rural ecosystem with, it, with water as its embodiment is being destroyed. True Galam said, look, the Reuters did their work in 20s and 2 does that gold smuggling mm -hmm. from Africa was costing the continent more than $15 billion. And given that Ghana is a major producer of gold, will certainly be well represented in that sample size, right? <laughs> and, and the rest of them. So if you see the Galam say, we are losing everything, because this is illegal, right? Indeed. We are losing the tax revenue from that, and, and all of that. Look, you put all this in. How do you think we can have a future if we don't take certain steps now? We will be so unique to think that we could continue on this path and we'll, we'll certainly get a different outcome. No. We certainly Countries that developed, they were intentional. Indeed. Let's put our hands together for our guests. I'll, I'll, I'll take um, some few comments from the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry as well, partnering us to, to do this. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Um, I want to start from the, the tax issue that you just mentioned. The government had forgotten that it's the private sector that is the engine of growth. 
Now, if you look at the interest rates, we are competing with the government. And usually we knew that the government has an upper hand. For the first time in the history of this country, that even banks are restructuring their loans in such a way that they make provision when they are even saving with the country, with their own country. Mm -hmm. It means that even borrowing from the private sector is much, much better than even borrowing from the central bank. Now, the tax issue that you just mentioned, they are forgotten that it's cyclical. If you tax us so much, because money that we deposit in the bank is out of our excesses in our spending. And so if our best sex, we, we deposit them in the bank. When we are overtaxed, we don't have the money that we deposit in the bank for the government even to borrow. And so once you go there with your might, you cut out the private sector. And the government has also forgotten that we are in a competitive environment. And that we are in a global world where other people are borrowing low. For the private sector to be competitive, we can't borrow at that rate. We cannot be taxed so much. If we are being taxed on consumption tax, if you are a minister or whoever it is, decide that we should be taxed on consumption tax, then it means that we have not seen anything. Anybody at all can tax when you are consuming. You get the revenue. But we have to be proactive as a nation to look at areas that we have to tax to prohibit, it, prohibit some spending and areas that we also have to tax that will also help the economic growth. We need to look at them together. I think that we need to look at the legal framework of our country. Go back and look at the constitution. Are we empowering the government so much? We are talking about democracy. Have we ever sat down to look at where government gets their funding to run their parties? They go and borrow money from other people. They need to reposition them. And whether they are even competent to hold those positions, we don't even know. As a nation, if you want going for and want to look at it, let's look at how this democracy we are going to look at it. Whether to fund government and so that whoever does anything, we hold them responsible. How are we going to work alongside with this when a party comes in with our democracy? Party A comes in with this manifesto. Party B comes in with a different manifesto. We need to have a consistent um, national policy. The national government planning, what are they doing? Are the manifestos in consonance with what they do? Or are we come in with our own manifestos? Mm -hmm. There are basic things that we need to look at it, even if it's coming from party A or party B. Education, some key sectors, driving sectors of the economy. Must be basic for everybody. When you are coming with your manifesto, you have that one, then you add something to it. And so that will be consistent in whatever we do. I don't think that is a good thing. For the first time, we are enslaving our youth because we are leaving the country. For the first time, people are leaving good jobs and they're running away. It's better than, it's, it's bad than those days when they were even physically enslaved because those days they were taking some money from, from them before they give them out. By this time, they are going on their own. People we have trained as a nation, we spend free education monies on them. Instead of them to stay and then give us back what they have earned, they are running away from as a nation. I think that we have failed. Right. Going forward, I think that we need to sit down as a nation right. and look at the issues that we have spoken as fundamental. Mm -hmm. And if, for the last one, we have leaders from all the constitution, uh, constituencies that we select to come into parliament. And we are saying that our leadership has a problem. Then as a nation, we have a problem because it's a sample size of the entire population. And so if you are picking leaders who we think they are doing very well, be it an MP, be it a CEO, be it whatever, it is our own choice, a sample size of the um, uh, population that we have picked them. It means that we have a fundamental problem as a nation that we need to go deep and identify them and then work with it together in order to be able to achieve the success that we are yearning for. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And that would lead us to the final comments from um, our distinguished panel members as well as we round this all-important conversation. I will start with you, Professor Kornofi Pomboating. 
well, in a minute. Listening to the economists <laughs> and the problem that we have that will take us at least 30 years to solve, I don't think 0.1% of Ghanaians are aware of what you are talking about. Mm. Because I, I don't understand everything that you are saying. So I assume that a lot of Ghanaians don't know what is happening. If we did, we'd be angry. So these things should trickle down. I don't know how um, Uncle Pianim and Professor who, or all of you communicate to Ghanaians about what is happening. Because it looks as if we, we don't know. And then also, um, the, when I was minister, I set up a department called Ghana Innovation Research Commercialization Center mm. at CSIR, mm. where we went round the universities and cataloged all the things that they were doing, things yeah. that could be commercialized. Yeah. But again, we live I and everything. That from University of Ghana. Uh, you remember? <laughs> everything breaks down. And then, sorry, my last comment about Adubia, uh, the things that you said about the local content. You see, when we are doing something, we must think about Ghana. We are happy, we have uh, automobile assembly plans, but I don't think we, Ghana is gaining anything from it. Because these companies know that by 2040, 2050, they will stop burning internal combustion engines. They are all going electric. Yes. So it is good to set up these factories here yeah. so we can go on with this. And the good thing is for them is that we guarantee the, the purchase of a quantity of the vehicles. That, that's why I know. The government has guaranteed that they, they will buy a quantity of the vehicles that are assembled here. And so look, talking about local content, that is why we started, right. I mean, we started this uh, machine, CNC machine tool center where we produce spare parts, okay. where we will produce machine parts, where we could reverse engineer things. Right. But then, uh, these things have all been stopped, and um, the rethinking. Uh, the I private sector is the engine of growth. But you see, if the engine is on the floor, and it's not connected to the vehicle, <laughs> and the private sector has no money, no skills, no technology, then it becomes very difficult. Yes. We need well, to equip, empower, give money to the private sector for that they can do their job. Thank you so much. And the question yeah, we, we cannot keep doing the same things and expect different results. That's insanity. It's in your presentation that never came. But final word on this in a minute before we go. On the insanity. Go, doing the <laughs> same things and, and expecting different results. What has to change in a minute yeah. before we go? In a minute. Please. Ghanaians have to change. Me, I don't believe in changing the constitution. It gives people the feeling that we are doing something when we are doing, we are doing nothing. The constitution we have is the best in terms of protecting human rights, is the best in terms of promoting Ghanaian entrepreneurship. It's putting it away. There are tinkerings we can do going down to uh, making the district assemblies an important part uh, of it. There are certain things we say that it's too strong uh, an executive. The president doesn't have the same power as an elected district chief executive. Right. Who has executive powers, legislative powers. The president doesn't have that. The president needs to go to uh, uh, parliament to pass laws. It's as Ghanaians. He has to go to the council of uh, uh, state to do certain things, to elect certain right. people in consultation with or on the advice of nobody has told me what you need to give uh, to the Council of State for them to do that. So if we as Ghanaians don't change and we continue to do things the same way, they say insanity is when you continue the same thing and you expect different results, it won't happen. What we need now is to reset the button. Right. And resetting the button means at the bottom there, we have to start from there. Not just talk. We've been talking about restructuring the economy. Donkey years. We've never worked it. Raising money through taxation 
it doesn't make sense. Okay. You can only do it when you get to a certain level. Right. So what we need to do that is re-examine expenditures. It means you take a look at it and say, this is the money that is coming through tax revenue. Right. And this is all I have. Let's spend it, as we said, making Ghanaians feel safe and then for education and this and that. At Lewis told us during Nkrumah's time, countries grow fast where the people feel safe right. to save savings mm -hmm. and invest. Which Ghanaian businessman feel safe to invest, to save here and invest? So we have to start that. And then once we start that, then probably we'll get onto the right path. But consistently, so what I wanted to give to you, the slide, yes. just the one with the, uh, with the anchor and the dolphin. The Italians, the Romans used to say, Festina lente, make haste slowly. Right. In Ghana, we say, Kahunabra, or go through slowly. So if we have that part, then we finish. Great. And he just says that slowly, we need to grow slowly and steadily. And if we are growing slowly and steadily without going through this um, stop go, yeah. right. that's the way to go. Yeah. And if that's the way to go, you need to create jobs for the young people, $10,000 to create a good industrial job. You that have seven. Uh, 700,000 young people joining. The youth are coming. We don't have enough money. We need to attract money from outside.